We're going to begin this session by singing to God's praise in Psalm 93. Psalm 93 is the Sing Psalms version. We're going to sing the whole of the psalm, and Lachie's going to lead us. Please be upstanding. The Lord is King, His throne endures, majestic We're going to read from the epistle to the Ephesians on chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. Ephesians 1 and 1 to 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. 
In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Amen. May God bless to us his word. We will now rise and constitute this session. Our Father in heaven, we bless you for that your word declares to us where the source of our salvation lies, lies in the grace of God, the command of God, the will of God, the decree of God to save us from our sin. And we give thanks for the security that that brings, for the security that we are conscious of today, that our salvation does not rest on our own decision, on our, or not even on our own faith, but it rests in the call of God, the decree of God, the decision of God to save those who were dead in trespasses and sins. And that decision, of course, resulted in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, his becoming one of us, his being born, and his being crucified, and suffering the unimaginable death of the cross, in which the Father made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that we may be the righteousness of God in him. Our Father, we bless you and rejoice today at his resurrection, at his ascension, and that he right now sits at the Father's right hand where he makes intercession for us, and where he acts as our high priest, and where he discusses every affair that concerns the Trinity. He discusses with the Father our congregations, our personal lives, our struggles, our joys and our sorrows, our courts, our sessions, our congregations, our preaching, our pastoral visitation, our people, and the state of Scotland. Our Father in heaven, we give thanks that all of these are a concern to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and that you have, that you have continued in your patience with us and your love towards your church. We pray, Father, to be faithful to the gospel today. And as we come now and constitute ourselves uh, as a general assembly one more time, and as we, consider to fo as we come to focus on the, the core issues that, that come to our attention, we ask, O oh Lord, that each one of us personally will have our hearts opened afresh by the Holy Spirit because we confess our corruption our sinfulness, our pride, our arrogance, our lust, our anger, our jealousy. Our Father in heaven, the list goes on. You know what our hearts are like. And we pray to be brought afresh to see the depth and the awfulness, the ugliness of our own sin before you. And if it is ugly to us, how much more must it be to the Holy Spirit who dwells within us? Our Father, we bless you today that you are a God who cleanses and that we can still come to you because our salvation does not depend on our own personal goodness, but it rests on our justification, that we have been declared as righteous before you. And so we pray, Father, that you will give us a fresh a fresh rejoicing in what Jesus has done and in how his righteousness has been credited to our account so that we can confidently stand before you today and lay hold of our great high priest. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you will give us wisdom in everything that we do today. Give us a sense of harmony, a brotherliness. We thank you for what we've already experienced and the way in which we can discuss 
the Bible and biblical issues, sometimes from slightly different perspectives, and yet we remain as your people, your servants, and we pray that, you, that what, what we discuss today will be pleasing to you, and the decisions that we make will be honoring to you and to the extension of your kingdom. Our Father, we long for different days. We long for the Holy Spirit to be poured out in our churches and in our communities. We long for people to be converted. We long for repentance. We long for newness of life among those we love, those we've been praying for, and those in our congregations who as yet don't know you. Our Father in heaven, we pray that our assembly will be an encouragement to us to go back rejoicing, knowing that we are not alone in all our struggles, but that, that uh, we face these as a brotherhood. And we ask that you will bind us together in your love. Our Father, take away our sin, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Now, I think we have the minutes of the first session. Edinburgh and within the Free Assembly Hall there on 23rd May 2022, which day the ministers and elders, commissioners from presbyteries appointed to meet this day were convened, and after sermon preached by Reverend Neil McMillan, moderator of the 2021 General Assembly, who preached from Psalm 22 on the theme of God's comfort and God's law, the call, the General Assembly was duly constituted. Then there was the election of the moderator. The General Assembly then proceeded to elect a moderator. And it was moved, seconded, and agreed that the Assembly appoint Reverend Principal Ivor Martin, Edinburgh Theological Seminary, to be their moderator. Intimation was then made to Mr. Martin, who, having been introduced and welcomed, took the chair, thanked the Assembly and the retiring moderator. And then uh, Reverend Jonathan de Groot added his thanks to the retiring moderator. The Assembly has agreed that we would just take comments from, for the minutes because the minutes have gone out to commissioners overnight. So if you have, if you have read the, the minutes, offer comments or corrections uh, to the clerk and we'll take that on board. Does anyone need a paper copy? Anyone need paper copies? So I will not uh, carry on with the, the rest Thank of you. the 20,000 words. Any comments? Any adjustments? He was looking forward to that. I was. <laughs> Spoiled it. <laughs> <laughs> I was all set. <laughs> Any questions or comments? It appears that everyone's happy. Well, let's hope that continues. Indeed. Thank you. one of these ones that keep coming up, I assure you. It's my great uh, privilege and pleasure to uh, invite the, the moderator uh, to come and address the assembly. Thank you. Brothers, the last two years have been amongst the most challenging in my lifetime. Never before in living memory have we experienced such disruption to everyday life and have our freedoms been curtailed so much. Such restrictions extended to every sector of society, not least to the church, forcing closures and severely limiting and indeed eliminating many of the practices which are so precious to us. Today we are profoundly thankful for two things. First of all, that in one sense, business continued as usual over these two years. 
Technology allowed for Zoom calls, prayer meetings, and Bible studies, and the ability to maintain a measure of gospel provision, indeed forcing us to extend our borders as never before. By my count, there were three or four congregations that had live stream provision before COVID. Today, most of the congregations within our denomination continue to use facilities which allow the message of Jesus Christ to extend well beyond our walls. Secondly, we are thankful for the progression beyond COVID that has resulted in today's large measure of normality. Yet, in another sense, we gather today in a climate of further nervousness. There is no guarantee of which direction COVID might move. Furthermore, the war in Ukraine has not only left tens of thousands dead, but has had a serious global impact. Utility prices have risen so sharply and so fast that serious fuel poverty is now inevitable on a wide scale. There are also the real and present dangers of the war extending, even into the unthinkable. COVID has also left more subtle, long-term scars on the church. It has left many ministers dazed, some to the point of mental exhaustion. But it has also undermined the very place that church had in our estimation. While the message churches are closed but worship continues contained a measure of truth, this message has been misinterpreted to give a semi-official sanction to the widespread replacement of in-person worship with what is available on the internet. We now have the option of choosing to go where we want online and to listen to our favorite preacher, depending on, on the mood of the moment. All of this means that if it was difficult enough facing the challenges of a secular world pre-COVID, that challenge has now been compounded by the threat within our Christian circles over the very place that church occupies. What is church? How important is actual physical worship? Is church essential or negotiable? Is an online sermon not the word of God? And can I not be edified by staying at home and watching my laptop? If it was impossible to get our non-Christian secular friends to come to church, what about the new challenge of getting your Christian friends to come to church? COVID has also introduced us to new terminology, furlough. Well, we knew what that was anyway. Lockdown, pandemic, self-isolation. But the one that catches my attention is the new normal which seems to suggest that life will now be different. And it introduces an uncertainty, an unknown, which is in itself a challenge. As we meet for the first time as an in-person General Assembly, it rather feels like a new beginning. In a way, it's business as usual, the resumption of the journey, but there's also a deep sense of the unknown. So it's no wonder that the church right now perhaps feels vulnerable fragile and somewhat uncertain as to how to proceed into the future. What then can I offer to you as leaders as we begin our assembly and as we gaze into the unknown and as we reflect on what may lie ahead or what Neil last night called rethinking ministry post-COVID? At my age, the temptation is to find a happy place and go to it. Our happy place may be the good old days, when life was simpler, there were no smartphones, you got to see your doctor, free church budgets were healthy, we had foreign missions and Gallic services. Hiding in past utopias, were they really utopias, is not a way forward. But neither is dispensing with the past Indeed, it is sometimes necessary to go back to a place of origin in order to reset or recalibrate towards future functionality. When my computer appears to be malfunctioning, there's a button allowing me to restore original settings. This option applies to more than just computers. It is, in fact, an important observation which was made 
by the celebrated Hispanic scholar and president of Princeton Seminary, John A. Mackay, who said this, there are times in the history of persons and peoples, particularly times of crisis, when a rediscovery of yesterday opens a new pathway to tomorrow, when the awakening of the sense of heritage becomes a potent determinant of destiny. Of course, as Mackay went on to recognize, it all depends on which past you choose to go to. Nonetheless, he goes on to ask an equally profound and relevant question. What constitutes the true heritage of a people, a culture, a person? How far is the destiny of these determined by their sense of heritage? The analogy Mackay chose to illustrate his point with is the comparison between a chauffeur and a boatman. A chauffeur, he says, only looks forward to find his direction. A boatman, on the other hand, quote, moves intelligently forward by looking backward. As he looks back at key landmarks on the shore behind him, he can determine the correct direction of travel. So as we revive our in-person assembly, I want my opening remarks to do just that. My task is to try to determine some landmarks behind us, the principles that make us, as the Free Church of Scotland, what we are. So that as we rise out of these last days, we can intelligently find our way into an uncertain future. The first of these landmarks is this. The Free Church is a denomination with a defined history, which means that we are united by incorporation, not just as a confederation or an association of loosely connected and yet autonomous congregations, but one national church. As Presbyterians, we believe that the church is not confined to the local congregation, but it exists as one corporate and indeed national body. That principle is made clear in Acts 15, where the whole church gathered to try to resolve the problem of circumcision. The great advantage of being a denominational church, rather than just a network of unrelated congregations, each one with its own constitution and independence, is that we can act as a collective unit, make corporate binding decisions via our leadership, and raise a coherent voice which we hope as we have opportunity, we'll proclaim gospel truth, not just to our communities, but to our nation. Despite the negativity which often accompanies the idea of denominations, this is where we're at, and there are real benefits to speaking with one voice. The history of the free church ultimately rests, of course, in the New Testament, the medieval church, and the church of the Reformation, but time only allows me to reflect on our specific denominational history, which of course is rooted in the disruption that took place on the 18th of May, 1843, here in Edinburgh. It consisted of 470 ministers walking away from the established Church of Scotland and re reconstituting themselves as the Church of Scotland Free under the leadership of Dr. Ch Thomas Chalmers. Long story short, the principle behind this monumental event, and it was an earth-shattering event, was the spiritual independence of the church and the right of the church to decide upon spiritual matters. The specific issue, of course, was patronage, the arrangement whereby a local landowner or patron exercised the right to nominate his choice of minister for the parish. Sometimes, where his choice coincided with the favor of the congregation, this worked. But it always ran the risk of conflict, because at root it deprived the congregation itself of its right to call its own minister. Things came to a head after a series of court cases appeared to suggest that the church would have to capitulate to the demands of the state, who argued that if the church was established, i.e. bound to the state, then there could only be one final authority, which was, in fact, the state. In other words, the state was insisting upon its right to tell the church who its ministers were going to be. The upshot was that Chalmers and the supporters of spiritual independence insisted 
that while the state under God did exercise its own jurisdiction, that did not extend to spiritual matters, which included the right of a congregation to choose their own pastor. After the failure of one final attempt to negotiate, a large proportion, most notably the evangelical wing of the church, decided that they had no alternative but to dissociate themselves from their established status and become the Free Church of Scotland. There are two things about our identity that stand out from this and that are not always understood. First, the principle of establishment itself, which holds that God rules over two kingdoms in this world, each one responsible for its own jurisdiction. By choosing to separate itself from its established status, the Free Church was not reneging on the establishment principle. Indeed, as a, as a denomination, we believe that if God should choose to revive our nation, there would be a restored, healthy relationship between church and state, where both would faithfully serve Jesus. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Meanwhile, it is our duty to seek every opportunity to engage with government in matters of mutual concern and interest. And this we indeed do. We seek to do graciously and respectfully through the efforts of our public engagement coordinator. Second, we hold to the independence of the church in spiritual matters. Our history and indeed our constitution is tied to the principle that when it comes to biblical matters, the church will not be told what to preach or teach by anyone else. I don't need to tell you that this principle is as relevant today as it ever was. It may only take one event for this time-honored principle to be challenged. That's what we sign up to when we sign our questions and formula. It is a formula that protects us by way of the Constitution of the Free Church of Scotland. The second landmark is this, that the Free Church of Scotland is united doctrinally by solemn and specific vows to a particular document. The teaching that the Free Church holds to is set out in the Bible, as explained by the Westminster Confession of Faith. At his ordination and induction, every minister and elder is required to subscribe to, quote, the whole doctrine contained in the confession of faith as the confession of his faith. The confession is one of five documents produced over a period of some eight years by the Westminster Assembly, who were a company of some 120 men, the best theological scholars in the UK and beyond, summoned by Parliament in rebellion against King Charles I's express command. The confession is simply a clear and thorough explanation of Bible teaching on key themes as agreed upon by the assembly and was heartily adopted by the Church of Scotland in 1647. But a voice may say, that's all very well, we're living in a different world. Are we not? Is it not time to dispense with past formulations and return to the Bible? And is today not an opportunity to start with a clean sheet? The no creed but the Bible mantra sounds amazingly pious, but in reality it will quickly result in every man expounding what is right in his own eyes. It is equally foolish to start with a clean sheet, which at best implies that we have no link with the past, and at worst that our forefathers knew nothing compared to us. The clean sheet philosophy will ultimately defer to our individual take on the Bible, which may range from the faithful to the reconstructionist. And why not? If there is no link to the past and if our forefathers knew less than us, worse still, if God has given new light to the current generation, then we are entitled to tear up the past and invent new ways of understanding scripture. In a strange irony, the very proponents of the clean sheet who say that confessions are man-made inventions, they wish to eradicate these and replace them with new man-made inventions, except this time, because they're modern, they must be superior. If you add to this the phenomenon of consumerism, Carl Truman says 
that you end up with the, quote, disappearance of the human nature that connects you in one time and place to another. Truman goes on to say, quote, the implications for creeds and confessions are obvious. Choose your particular. They are written by dead white males who dress differently to us, had different attitudes to the world, spoke in a different language, were celibate, were not celibate, never understood technology or listened to Elvis. If nothing binds us to them, or if the differences between us and them simply overwhelm any analogy there might be between us, then they have nothing useful or relevant to say to us, and we're better off ignoring them. To suggest that in a missional context, such as today's world, we need to dispense with creeds and just use the Bible is disastrous. In a missional context, the church needs to be absolutely clear about what it teaches. The number of charlatans that have been successful in Africa and Asia are the only proof you need to know that many people take advantage of young churches to sell their own wares. In a missional context, the church, on the other hand, needs to be absolutely crystal clear, not least for the sake of the seeker. What seekers are looking for is the kind of clarity that can only be found in a thorough, historic understanding of what we believe. We owe it to them and to young churches to make the teaching of Scripture as robust as possible. The confession was never designed to replace or even accompany the Bible. Rather, it's a clarification of what the core doctrines of the Bible are. And insofar as it re represents Bible teaching, it can be trusted and subscribed to. Besides, by way of its opening statements, the confession actually provides a necessary, detailed, comprehensive statement on what the authority, infallibility, and inerrancy of Scripture means, and confirms that the Bible, as the Word of God, is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy God. And while some might imply that this is too restrictive, I find it one of the most liberating statements that there is. To suggest that creeds are divisive and sectarian is also not true. The confession, far from being a sectarian document, is actually the opposite. The purpose of its composition was in fact to unite churches in Scotland, England, and Ireland, and indeed beyond, under one commonly held doctrinal statement. The 120 Westminster men were diverse, and the assembly itself witnessed lengthy debates, not all of which were amicable. What is truly remarkable was the extent to which many, including the Scots, surprisingly, were prepared to accommodate other positions in order to find a unified way forward and to create one church across the three nations. What kind of men were these? Were they cold, legalistic, divisive, scholastic? Absolutely not. George Gillespie's closing address is one of the most moving moments of the assembly and one of the clearest windows into his mind, lamenting the measure of disagreement that there was between him and his opponents. He said, a word of love and affection. I wish that they, people who disagree with us, prove to be as unwilling to divide from us as we have been unwilling to divide from them. I wish that instead of toleration, there may be, note this, a mutual endeavor for a happy accommodation. There is a certain measure of forbearance, but it's not so seasonable now to be talking of forbearance, but mutual endeavors for accommodation. Anyone who thinks the confession is divisive ought to read the incredibly challenging chapter entitled The Communion of the Saints. Saints by profession are bound to maintain a holy fellowship and communion in the worship of God. I would like some of our more exclusive brethren to read and remind themselves of this, this very clear statement that God requires us to seek ways of finding fellowship with other believers. This is one of the clearest statements that there is. 
and in performing such other spiritual services as tend to their mutual edification. And also in relieving each other in outward things according to their several abilities and necessities. Which communion, as God offers opportunity, is extended unto all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. That's real ecumenism. That is, that is uh, brought together, that is uh, defined by the Westminster Confession of Faith. The upshot is, of course, that the confession was intended to be and has served as a unifying document. It will not formally, it will not formally unite Baptists and Presbyterians over baptism or Presbyterianism, but within a paedo-Baptist context, uh, it has served well to unite and not divide. And it reminds us that we must seek fellowship with all believers, whatever their background and context. Over the centuries, it has come in for criticism, particularly over its Calvinistic character. Theologians like Thomas Torrance have not been shy to say that its theological statements were formalized at times with almost frigid logical definition. Torrance's dislike of the confession wasn't new. It may surprise some of you to discover that in the latter half of the 19th century, a large group of ministers in the Free Church of Scotland decided that the confession wasn't cool. For them, it was no longer relevant to a romantic and modern enlightened age. Besides, it was asked by one free church minister, does God not reveal new things to his church in providence? The upshot of this unrest over confessional subscription was the composition of a document in 1892 known as the Declaratory Act. And this sought to adjust the terms by which ministers and office bearers subscribed to the confession by limiting it to only what was of the substance of the faith. Oh dear. Which of course begged the question, who decided what was of the substance of the faith and what was not? The answer was the church and its various assemblies. What they didn't seem to get whether well, this decision dragged them all the way back to pre-Reformation times, to the magisterium of the church and their authority to determine what was right or not. I hope today, brethren, instead of dismissing our confession like some of our forefathers, we will rediscover it, treasure it, and unashamedly incorporate its teaching into our sermons and Bible studies and regular church life. And that, of course, includes the P word. The Free Church of Scotland holds to and unashamedly teaches the doctrine of predestination. Not in the simplistic sense of Holy Willie's prayer, for whom God sends aim to heaven and tend to hell for thy glory and no for only good or ill they've done afore thee. And certainly not from a hyper-Calvinistic perspective, but rather the truly balanced, combined realities of the sovereignty of God and the free offer of the gospel. According to a re recent Church of Scotland video, some of our friends across the road dislike the doctrine of predestination and want to airbrush it out. Interestingly, so did some of our forefathers in the 19th century free church. The problem is the Apostle Paul loved it. Anyone who denies predestination has a major problem on their hands when trying to preach from John 6, Romans 8, and Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for our adoption to himself as sons, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Of course, this doesn't mean, this does not require us to understand the doctrine or to try and reconcile it with the equally biblical command to go and preach the gospel to all nations, to offer Jesus to every man and woman and child. We have to accept both as equally biblical mandatory commands. 
So it's one thing to have a historical document that keeps us in line and that defines the doctrinal boundaries over which we may not cross, but is that all that is? Does it serve purely as a regulator for the purpose of guarding against heresy? Is it a document to be kept hidden away and only brought out at certain ecclesiastical occasions or when God forbid some rogue minister might preach a dodgy sermon? Brethren, I believe with all due respect that we make a huge mistake, I'm sure you don't, if we consign doctrine to the reference section or the seminary or the theological conference and fail to make it the stuff of regular pulpit ministry and encourage our people to think deeply. Doctrine is not just for the seminaries, it's for the people and not just the old but the young. This was brought home to me as recently as last month when at bedtime I was reading the story of the fall to my two granddaughters who now live with us. As I closed the dilapidated copy of Catherine Voss Child's Story Bible, a voice came unsolicited from underneath the bedclothes. So, you passed your sin to mum and she passed her sin to us. Yes, there was a pause after the question. Quite apart from this being an attempt to stay up as long as possible, it was also an audacious attempt to blame me for their sin. <coughs> Nonetheless, I was now suddenly immersed in a deep theological conference on the subject of the transmission of sin with a 10-year-old. Brethren, you cannot answer it, a question like that satisfactorily without an understanding of systematic theology such as found as Calvin's Institutes or our Confession. Moreover, if the simple reading of Catherine Voss provokes such an inquiry in the mind of an ordinary 10-year-old, should we not expect similar thought processes to be taking place in the minds of our congregations every Sunday? Or do we just assume that they won't think that way? We are doing our flocks a great disservice if we reduce the content of our preaching to what is accessible, or worse still, what is palatable, and fail to take our people into the theological depths which alone will satisfy their questions. And by the way, that of course includes the doctrine of the love of God, which should never be reduced to a one-liner or an assumption. If the love of God is so high you can't get over it, and so wide you can't get round it, it deserves to be explored in all of its doctrinal depth and biblical breadth. Our job as ministers and teachers is to translate the often obscure language of the confession into the vernacular using everyday il illustrations on a Sunday. I've heard it done in this very building. And our job is to apply such doctrine to meet the challenges of everyday life. In the minds of some, doctrine and mission are, are uh, incompatible. I mean, what connection is there between predestination and mission? How can you go out and tell people that Jesus died for them if you don't actually know whether Jesus did die for them? If you're going to be true to limited atonement, then forget the free offer of the gospel. The fact is that for all the perceived dichotomy between a Calvinist church and mission, Mission has always been at the heart of the Reformation Church in Scotland. On the title page of the Scots Confession of 1560 are the words of Matthew 24 and 14. And this glad tidings of the kingdom shall be preached throughout the whole world for a witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. Of course, for the 200 or so years after the Reformation, it was enough for the church to establish itself and defend its liberty from the attempted intrusions of successive kings. Thereafter, in the early part of the 18th century, during the Marrow Controversy, the church was divided over the terms of the gospel, how to present it, and what was required as the basic components of faith. But eventually, mission as we know it increasingly did come to the fore, particularly in the 18th century. By the time of the disruption, mission had become a major activity of the Presbyterian Church. And indeed, after 1843, this continued and became a defining feature of the new Free Church of Scotland. In the 20th century, despite its small size, 
The Free Church was passionate about what, is co- what was called then its foreign mission in India, South America, South Africa, and CWI. Mission was a big deal for all its alleged traditionalism in the 20th century, the Free Church was fully engaged in spreading the gospel to where Christ was not known. Of course, things have changed, and perhaps in the 20th century we did not pay enough attention to the decline in our churches at home. And then, arguably, turning points came in the 70s and 80s. But today, we are engaged in an audacious project in which we aim to plant 30 new churches by the year 2030. None of this comes at the expense of our confessional commitment or our conviction in the sovereignty of God in evangelism or our belief in the free offer of the gospel, quite the reverse. It is because we believe that God saves that we can confidently plant churches and share the gospel. If salvation depended on individual belief or faith or the choice of whoever decided to accept Christ, then we're doomed in a secular age. If our dreams of church growth depend on the free will of today's individuals deciding for Christ, we haven't a hope in a world where, quite frankly, nobody will believe. But if we believe that the gospel itself is the power of God to salvation, if we believe that God has many in this city, if we believe that all whom the Father gives to Jesus will come to him, then we can confidently go out with the gospel against all of the odds, knowing that the most determined, rampant secularism in the world cannot resist the power of God's Spirit at work. In the message of the crucified Savior, So confessionalism informs our evangelism and gives us the confidence to continue persevering in the knowledge that our work, your work, is not in vain. Third landmark, Presbyterianism. The Free Church is a Presbyterian church. Presbyterianism amounts to the following. Instead of congregations having to make every decision, they elect mature and trusted wise leaders to represent their interests and to exercise pastoral oversight over them and to make biblical decisions that will be in the best interests of unity, fellowship, and the expansion of the gospel. We believe that Presbyterianism is rooted in the New Testament where elders, plural, were established in each newly planted church. As a collective system, insisting upon parity and plurality, it guards against the dominance of one man. Furthermore, it provides a process of appeal and consultation beyond the local and the individual. As decisions, sometimes disputes, vexing questions are resolved by wider courts of the church, there ought to be a sense of satisfaction in the collective judgment of concerned, wise, prayerful minds. Ever further, our National Presbyterian Church, uh, which stretches over the country, provides the structure for strategic thinking, planning, and decision-making, and even further, as a fellowship of united, like-minded brothers, each of whom is involved in the work of the gospel, with all its challenges, we need the regular encouragement and prayerful counsel of one another. It's a band of brothers, a company of pastors, Presbyterianism operates collectively and corporately. It is the one and two gathering in the name of Jesus to make decisions as they seek his guidance. I have two questions before I bring things to a close. My first question today is not whether presbyteries are biblical, but whether the system is working. Are our presbyteries effective? Are they places where we can be a band of brothers, a company of pastors, where we can be honest with one another, where we are refreshed by seeing one another, praying with one another, eating with one another, where we can share our experiences in ministry, or do we simply meet to get the business out of the road? And if it's necessary to ask that question about presbyteries, how much more ought our assembly? 
to be a place of real interaction, fellowship, and enjoyment. Neil touched on this last night. I was glad he did. The assembly represents the free church nationally, where debates can be had, questions answered, and disputes settled. So, at the risk of controversy, come on, you can allow me one provocative statement. Why have we shortened our assembly? I hear cost and efficiency. But surely our gathering ought to be more than getting through the necessary business. For me, assemblies are a wonderful and rare opportunity to reconnect with old friends, especially after COVID, enjoy dinner, catch up. My memories of past assemblies is that they only got going by Friday. I'm not suggesting they extend beyond Friday. If we're going to curtail things to the bare necessities, and if we're going to stay up half the night, bleary-eyed, we may well end up sacrificing what is most precious, the fellowship of our brethren and the unity of our leadership. I am not blaming anyone, by the way, and neither am I arguing against procedure or legislation. Our procedure and legislation is such that if you don't like it, we change it. These are, in fact, vital components for ensuring smooth running and maintenance of good practice within our courts. But if things could be done better, our structure allows us to make whatever changes are necessary for the good of the church and its leadership forums. What's more, for a number of years now, a large proportion of our assemblies have been made up of elders and ministers who have not spent their whole lives in the free church. Assembly is thus an important opportunity to integrate and get to know new faces. If we have gone to the cost of being here and come a long distance, then surely an additional day is only going to enhance the benefit of being together. Is, also, is assembly not also a golden opportunity for a big one-off public event with perhaps a guest speaker and where singing raises the roof, where we would all be uplifted and edified? We are missing opportunities, brethren. Here's another question. You'll allow me two provocative questions. Our Presbyterianism would work better if there was more representation and, and continuity. Under present arrangements, a minister can only expect to be in an assembly once every three years, even less if you're in the Edinburgh Presbytery. How does that aid continuity of debate? How does that help check the progress of strategic projects from one year to another? How can this year's assembly's cohort intelligently follow up on last year's decisions if they are a different bunch? These questions are not criticisms of any person. They're observations and suggestions for the better operations of our courts. For today, though, for this week, I hope that the debates will be a joy even if there is disagreement and voting, as there was last night, and I hope that the same spirit continues as there was last night, and I hope the Assembly is a forum where every member can feel that they contribute without fear of in, in, uh, intimidation. For all its deficiencies, uh, a Presbyterianism ought to be an absolute delight. Here's my second question, and with this I close. So much for sessions, presbytery, synods, and assemblies, but is Presbyterianism confined to leadership forums? I am going to suggest no. As I talk to people, I hear too much of them and us, us and Edinburgh, as if Edinburgh was the place where real decisions are made and detached from the rest of the church. If that is true, we have a lot of work to do to integrate our people. The Reformed Church in the unique Scottish context grew up, grew as a people's movement. It arose in direct opposition to attempted rules by bishops, archbishops, and ultimately the monarch. When the Scottish Church was threatened, most notably by King Charles I and Archbishop Laud, it was the people who rebelled and en masse signed the National Covenant of 1638. That sense of corporate belonging is what Presbyterianism is all about. It is rooted in the Bible where, for example, in Acts 6, the decision of the apostles to ordain deacons pleased the whole multitude. And it extends beyond this room today. It extends to our people, all of them. So here's my last question. 
and what I believe is one of our greatest challenges as a denomination. To what extent do our people feel that they belong to this denomination? I have no doubt they feel they belong to the congregation, but to what extent do they feel part of a church that extends beyond their local congregation? When I asked that question recently to an elder who hasn't belonged in the free church, he answered, they don't. In some places, there is a perceived disconnect between local congregations and the real free church as a wider body. And as long as that exists, we are failing in our Presbyterianism. Fathers and brethren, I believe is this is a great challenge that we need to address urgently if we're to remain as one strong united denomination and to be an effective corporate force for the Christian good of Scotland. If our people do not feel that the work of the denomination is their work, if they don't feel part of the great projects we are engaged in, they will naturally give preference to local concerns, but then we will not be acting presbyterially. I'll cut to the chase. Right now, as a church, we're engaged in a ministerial training program, which is going to play a vital part in future ministry. Our church is actively engaged in the 3030 church planting project. Much of the funding for this project comes from the USA, for which we are profoundly thankful. But the question is, how is such an ambitious project to be sustained over many years? Is it by continuing to plead with brothers outside our boundaries? Possibly. But I want to suggest that we also need to ask, how can we become more self-supporting as a denomination? The answer can only be determined as our people feel that they are part of the denominational work. It might surprise some of you to discover that this is not the first time support from the outside has been sought At the very beginning of the Free Church, a delegation was sent to the USA to ask for support from like-minded Presbyterian brothers. And this was partially successful, apart from the controversy it raised over sending back the money. But Chalmers knew that the long-term maintenance of this new denomination could not depend on the initial support they were getting from outside because that support would dry up. He knew that the development of the church had to come from within. And guess what? There were a few strong, large congregations who gave more and lots of small congregations who tended to be on the receiving end. Now, here's the rub. When it, comes to the, when it came to the question over who should shoulder the financial burden of the continued growth, the provision of ministry and church extension, Chalmers did not look to the larger congregations. He targeted the smaller, receiving ones, and challenged them with what he called the power of the infinitesimal. When he found out that £6,000 was spent on snuff in the island of Islay alone, (laughs) he was raging, and he saw his chance to respond to those who said they couldn't give. And at the 1844 General Assembly, he said, the power of littles is wonderful. I began with pennies. I now come down to pinches and say that if we got but a tenth of the snuff used by Highlanders, every tenth pinch, it would enable us to support our whole ecclesiastical system in the Highlands. He went on to say, it is astonishing the power of infinitesimals. The mass of the planet Jupiter is made up of infinitesimals. And surely after that, it is in the power of infinitesimals to make up a stipend for the minister of Balachulish. I want to translate Chalmers into the 21st century and say, first of all, please hear me out on this. First of all, the point here is not to name and shame poor, weak congregation. That's the last thing we want to do. The last thing small congregations need to hear is a reminder of how weak they are. If they do, 
they will all too easily become discouraged and accustomed to a feeling of non-entity and opt out, believing that they are not part of the real free church, and that's going to get us nowhere. We need to send out the opposite message. Now, they are a real vital part of our denomination, and as such, as they are enthusiastically drawn into what we are doing and what we can do as a denomination, the funding will follow where there is excitement. Brethren, there is excitement, I hope. We don't want to badger people into giving more. We want to excite them into giving. You might be surprised at me saying, these, saying this at a time of heightened pressure of cost of living and so on. But we're talking here about the kingdom and people's love for the kingdom and people's longing for the kingdom to grow. Chalmers was a past master at arousing excitement of what the denomination was doing. And so we must be in our congregations. The responsibility for arousing enthusiasm is ours, brothers. We're planting churches and training for ministry and mission. What greater work can any denomination be engaged in? Such ambitions can only be done by a corporate church, and we are in a wonderful position to do it for the Christian good of Scotland. I use that phrase intentionally. It was, of course, coined by Thomas Chalmers in a statement which I'm sure you've all heard all too often misquoted when he said, who cares about the free church compared with the Christian good of the people of Scotland? Who cares about any church but as an instrument of Christian good? For be assured that the moral and religious well-being of the population is of infinitely higher importance than the advancement of any sect. He said this, and it was a throwaway comment, at a public meeting in Edinburgh in December 1845, it has often been interpreted as implying that the free church was somehow dispensable to him, and, in, in, and hence that the free church doesn't matter. Nothing could be further from the truth. The context in which he said this was the West Port, not far from where we are, which was notorious for the squalor in which people lived in incredible poverty and deprivation, the likes of which we have never seen in Scotland. He saw the gospel as the only hope, as the context in which there could be meaningful change. Brothers, Thomas Chalmers cared deeply about the Free Church of Scotland. He saw it into existence and was passionate about its development and growth, to the point where he probably met an early death because of his enormous workload in leading the denomination. Chalmers was passionate about the denomination because he saw its gospel potential for the Christian good of Scotland. So finally, having then set out three historic, doctrinal, and presbyterial landmarks, which I hope give some direction to the future, I hope we care deeply about the Free Church of Scotland, not for what it stood for and did in the past, or as a bygone happy place where some of us can hide in our nostalgia, but as a present dynamic force which under the power of the Holy Spirit in the gospel can truly bring about the Christian good of Scotland. Thank you, brothers. I don't think this is my official job, but I thank you very much, Ivor. Uh, it's great to be reminded of the past and the great ground in which we stand as we move forward into the future. So I want to thank you so much uh, for your leadership, for your words and your wisdom, and invite you now to give the report of the Committee on the Loyal and Dutiful Address. I can fit my laptop um, on this lectern. This report is taken standing. Okay. 
I, I do hope this report is in order. Um, if not, then please um, make uh, any suggestion you wish to make. This is the, uh, the loyal and dutiful address uh, to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. May it please Your Majesty, we, the ministers and elders of the Free Church of Scotland, met in General Assembly on the 23rd of May, 2022, humbly offer Your Majesty the expression of our continued loyalty to Your Majesty's person and throne, and to the constitutional monarchy of which you are the honoured head and representative. We pray for Your Majesty's parliaments in Westminster and Holyrood, committing to our great God, the Prime Minister and the First Minister and their respective governments, in the many responsibilities that devolve upon Your Majesty's servants at home and abroad. While it has been over a year since the passing of His Royal Highness, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, we continue to express our sincere and prayerful sympathies to Your Majesty, praying that the God of all consolation will grant to Your Majesty and all of the royal family his own continued comfort and strength. We are thankful for the liberty that we now enjoy after the recent pandemic, and we wish to once again thank Your Majesty for Your Majesty's continued expressions of concern over the welfare of our nation. We rejoice in your recovery from COVID-19 and pray for Your Majesty's continued strength over the coming days. We are also thankful to Your Majesty's governments for the effort made to protect the peoples of the United Kingdom from COVID-19. We mourn the loss of so many lives to this virus in our nation and across the world. We acknowledge with gratitude those employed within the National Health Service, home carers and all essential workers whose tireless work served all our communities during a time of lockdown. We join with the rest of the nation in heartily congratulating Your Majesty on the occasion of Your Majesty's Platinum Jubilee. We rejoice in the many years He has given to Your Majesty and give thanks to God for Your Majesty's faithful service, uh, faithful service extraordinary, faithful and extraordinary service, wisdom and example over these years. We note the dutiful service of several members of Your Majesty's family who assist in your royal and constitutional duties and promote many charities and good causes. As we remember the service and sacrifice made by many in previous conflicts, we also express our thankfulness for the continued service and sacrifice of all Your Majesty's armed forces serving at home and abroad. We remember in our prayers all who have loved ones and those who have lost loved ones, and those who have suffered injury in mind and body. We thank Almighty God for the work of Your Majesty's chaplains to the Armed Forces and the Ministry of the Soldiers and Airmen Scripture Readers Association. During a time of global instability, we continue to pray for peace. Your Majesty, as ministers and elders of the Free Church of Scotland, be assured that we pray regularly for Your Majesty's person, family, and governments. We commit ourselves and our congregations to do so willingly and as we are encouraged to do so by God's word. We give thanks to God for our Saviour Jesus Christ and our shared faith. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. So pray your majesty's most faithful subjects, the ministers and elders of the Free Church of Scotland in General Assembly convened. Appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, sorry, sorry, Mother. Ask her any questions? First of all. Oh, uh, any questions? <coughs> I did note one or two errors. You, some of you have probably noted them, so I did note one or two of them. So I'll correct these as time goes on. Moved, seconded. I've seconded it. So. Okay. Am I allowed to finish it? Yes. No. no. <laughs> Somebody else seconded it. Angus, thanks very much. Okay. Right. Back to you, boss. I think it is time now for the report of the mission board. Yes, Mark, uh, before we, we do any? that, can, can we just check that uh, commissioners have two um, amendments, or sorry, one amendment and one addenda 
There is one from Duncan McPherson, which came in last week. I overlooked that last evening to mention that to you, but that has been in since last Thursday. And there is one that came in at the close of business yesterday from James Fraser. So we should have uh, one amendment from James Fraser and one addendum from Duncan McPherson. And just to announce also that uh, the water coolers are now being installed at the back of the building. So, I see again. The water coolers are being installed okay. at the back of the building for okay. the benefit of commissioners. All right. Um, I, I should have said that please feel free. Uh, you don't need to feel that you have to sit all the time, um, conscious that that's bad for us. Uh, so please feel free to get up and wander around from time to time. Um, so I call now, uh, do we all have the amendments in our, no? Some of us don't have the amendments. So if you want paper copies, if they can raise their hands and you can have paper copies. Can I also ask those of you who are members of the assembly, can you please uh, come and sit uh, in the body of the main body of the assembly. Those of you who are commissioners, it makes it much easier uh, to see you if you are present in the main body. Okay, we call for the, uh, the report uh, of the Mission Board, David McLeod, please. Moderator and fathers and brethren, visitors, guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a privilege for me today to be able to present to you the Mission Board Report, which you'll find on page 22 of uh, the Assembly Papers. I'll ask for your patience. I'm somewhat of a, a, a novice in terms of General Assembly. I think I've stood uh, at this podium for maybe five minutes, some total over the course of the years. Uh, so. Uh, I will ask for your patience and for your prayers as I seek to, to navigate uh, through this uh, report. And first of all, uh, let me uh, offer my congratulations to you, uh, Ivor, on your appointment as moderator. It's uh, already been a blessing, and I'm sure this year will be a blessing uh, to us all. If you have the report uh, to hand, uh, you can see that the report is fairly lengthy. Uh, 20 pages or so. It's maybe not as lengthy as it has been in past years, but still, uh, it's a fair read, and I don't intend to step through this report uh, page by page, which I think will be an encouragement to you all. Uh, I was told in the past, actually, before, uh, before even coming into ministry, that uh, when you're given the task of being a chairman, 
Uh, part of that task, an important part of that task, is, is not to speak too much yourself. The chairman's uh, job is to ensure that uh, everybody else in the room, in the meeting, has the opportunity uh, to speak. And so uh, that's kind of the way I've approached being a chair in the past, and it's the way I approach being a chair uh, at the, the present time. Uh, and so I'm not going to say too much uh, today at this point. Uh, you're going to hear just in the next few minutes from uh, some of my colleagues, from uh, uh, David Meredith, our mission director, and uh, Neil, uh, our, our church planting director. You'll also hear from Martin Patterson, who will speak uh, about the work of Global Mission, and uh, Sarah will uh, say a little about the church equipping uh, stream too, uh, if the assembly give permission for Martin and Sarah to, to speak. All I really want to say uh, by way of introduction is John chapter 15 and, and verse 5. Uh, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And sometimes, you know, you're given a word in ministry that resonates and it, and it sticks. And uh, that text always takes me back to, to day one in ministry. I was in a different denomination. I was in the Church of Scotland, uh, and I was being ordained and inducted into uh, Loch Caron. The minister along the road, uh, Derek Morrison in Gearloch, uh, he addressed me, and I've never forgotten what he said. Uh, he said something along the lines of this. He said, there are lots of things, lots of tasks, lots of uh, duties, lots of uh, methods, lots of strategies that uh, are all part of the, the, the work of ministry. And he said, I could speak at length about many of these different uh, things, these techniques, these strategies, these, uh, these tasks that uh, you'll encounter. But he said, I'm not going to say anything about any of these things today. He said, all I want to, to say is uh, stay close to Jesus in ministry. Uh, the key thing to remember in ministry is to, is to keep focused on Jesus. He is the vine. Uh, he is the, the life source. Uh, you are a branch. And in his strength, much can be done in the way of uh, mission and, and ministry. And apart from him, if there's drift, if there's distance from Christ, uh, nothing that is done will be of any impact. So what's the task of the mission board? Well, I think it's the same as the task uh, of the minister, and I think it's the same as the task uh, and the privilege of, of every believer. It's to stay close to Jesus. Uh, Neil uh, said in his uh, sermon last night, we're to, we're to fix our eyes on the crucified Christ. Uh, we cannot stress, he said, uh, the, the, the cross too much. It's the place that we're to be coming back to, to every day. We're to look to Jesus. We're to keep pointing people to Jesus. So as churches are planted uh, uh, nationally, uh, and as, as global uh, mission progresses internationally, uh, people in Scotland are, are, are and, and people across all nations, those who are, who've moved from all nations into Scotland, and, uh, and us as we connect with all nations, uh, people are hearing the good news about Jesus, that he has done it, as we heard last evening in Psalm 22. And as churches are developed and as churches are revitalized, that comes through congregations uh, remaining or abiding in, in Jesus. So what does a healthy church look like? We, 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 know the, we know the vision statement well now. We see it behind us. A healthy church uh, looks, as was said in one of the seminars, the, the webinars during lockdown, it looks like a church that's full of Jesus. So that's our ambition as a board. That's our, our prayer. That's the, 
That's the big picture. And I'm going to hand over now to uh, my colleagues to, to ask them to speak a little bit more about what that uh, maybe looks like in practice in the different streams. So, uh, first of all, I'll call on our mission director, uh, David Meredith. He said that the, the podium here is slightly off center, it's stressing him out, so I've done what I can to, to try and make it slightly worse for him. Mother here, fathers and brethren, no, what's stressing me is that these two are similar, but that one's quite different, but uh, I'll cope. Four issues in 10 minutes. Um, first one I want to talk to is about church development. We're on a church development track. In the Free Church of Scotland, we've got approximately 115 congregations. Now, many of them, most of them are existing congregations with, with assets. They've got manses, they've got churches, they've got money in the bank. Some of them have got substantial money in the bank. So we really see there's tremendous potential within these existing congregations, and we've embarked in this uh, development, church development track. It's generally called revitalization, but you can maybe discuss this. Some folks say that as a, a stigma. They don't like to be regarded as in a revitalization uh, situation. Personally, I like the word revitalization. It's got a little bit more spark to it than merely church development. Um, I don't know what you think about that. So it's a series of seminars. It's a, a track that lasts uh, for two years, a series of, of seminars with, with various speakers. Actually, most of them come from within our own denomination, and I have been really impressed at the standard of talks and, and ideas. So in the course of two years, a minister will hear hundreds of ideas not every one of them will, will be relevant, but one or two of them may stick and will be helpful. It's a, a band of brothers. The idea is it's a cohort learning from one another, and it's been so good to see uh, ministers from a variety of contexts coming together. Some didn't know uh, others and, and, and were really unfamiliar with their ministry context. So I hope that, again, some of the the gentlemen who've been through that will maybe stand up and speak of, of the benefits. We've got a great diversity uh, in the free church, which is a strength. Um, the redevelopment track or the church development track will only be the redevelopment track or the church development track will only be last, have lasting benefit uh, if congregations embrace the ideas afterwards. And congregations have already embraced it in that they pay for it. They pay for the ministers to go away. Uh, the denomination generously uh, comes up with uh, Tesco meal deal sandwiches. That's our contribution. Uh, and it's maybe something that we've got, got to look at. We really do run things on uh, a shoestring. And so when, when finished, um, the ministers are offered two things, or the congregations are offered two things. Congregations are offered the potential of embarking on a strategic process. We will walk them through coming up with their own development plan. We cannot come up with your development plan. Um, you know, that's not the way it works. But what we can do is we can facilitate your congregations to think out a strategic plan for the next uh, few years. Some folk don't like the idea of strategy. Maybe even some folk in here don't like the idea of strategy. Think of it this way. Paul may plant, Apollos may water, but God gives the increase. So we can do nothing about the increase, but we can help you and help each other with our planting skills and our watering skills. We can help each other with the gardening skills, and it's up to God to bring uh, the increase. There's no great division, actually, between planting and revitalization the edges are extremely blurred. And, you know, Neil does a seminar at the church development track uh, on what existing churches can learn from church planting. So we're looking at places like, like Greenock, um, which we call a radical revitalization. Paisley, there, is, there are no services in Paisley at the moment. Uh, it is the intention to restart that. Is that revitalization? or is it a new church plant? 
East Kilbride, again, is in a similar situation. These are places that really could do with a whole new reset, a whole new set of, of DNA uh, put into them. So please consider the church development track. Consider joining it. We'll probably run it at least for one more year. We've done 25 people so far. I think there's capacity for one more year uh, of a two-year course. So if you're interested, please speak to us. Rural ministry is the second thing. Church development track, rural ministry. 95% of the landmass of Scotland is rural. 21% of the population of Scotland is rural. There's various interesting features about rurality. There's a declining rural population. Those of you from the Western Isles, for example, you're experiencing significant uh, depopulation. That's typical of rural situations. Uh, in rural situations, the age profile is typically uh, older. The General Assembly asked us a few years ago to look at rural situations, and we've done that. Uh, we've organized two conferences so far. We're calling these ones In a Big Country, and is getting rural congregations on the agenda. We're talking about supporting congregations in the various uh, rural areas. And in Scotland, in the free church these days, uh, rural is rural borders, we're looking at that. the county of Angus, we're looking at that, as well as the highlands and islands. We, uh, our stated uh, impact is a healthy gospel uh, church in every community in Scotland. We may not be doing, you know, every community, but we're certainly looking to expand uh, the reach into these um, areas. Mission is, as we heard last night, from everywhere to everywhere. And uh, but in terms of rural ministry, please uh, remember places that are often forgotten. Uh, take a, a drive up the A83, is it, uh, up to Argyll, the rest and be thankful. The congregations of Campbellton, for example, uh, was really, really low. Uh, Roger Crooks has gone there, has got it into a, a condition where it's, it's beginning to, to move. Uh, it's vacant at the moment, but it's in a great place. Uh, a, a few new families have come into the congregation. Please consider a place like, like Campbellton, uh, Wick. Uh, I, again, places like that really need ministry. Remember the words of Francis Schaeffer, no little places, no little people. Thirdly, the annual survey. I want to talk about that. Now, uh, there's a degree of misunderstanding about this annual survey. The, the returns are not as good as we had anticipated. Only about half the congregations fill in the annual congregational survey. At the very least, we really need numbers. We, we would really love to know how many folk are in the Free Church of Scotland. That would be really helpful. So, uh, even if you hand back the mere statistics, now, it's not just another form. If folks say it's just another form, it's not. It's one of the most wonderful, useful tools that you as a congregation have. And once you realize that, you'll be writing the mission board, thanking them for such an inspired idea. Because what it does is, it gets a Kirk session every year to simply analyze how the year has gone and ask itself some key questions. It only takes about an hour to fill in. So, I don't know. I'm sure you can find one hour in the year to fill in the annual congregational survey. Again, it is helpful, and we'd be interested to know why do congregations, why do Kirk sessions find it difficult to reflect on what's going on in the congregation over that last year? Um, one, there's a final question on it. Uh, and the final question is, is there anything else you would like to share? And one of our ministers wrote, I got a puppy. So I, I think he was being well, I don't know. You, I, I'm not revealing who the minister is, but in one of the newest cities in Scotland, you would expect something a little bit more uh, interesting. Uh, so we need stats. We really do need statistics 
How many members there are in, in the free church? Lastly and finally, coaching. Uh, we can offer coaching to any minister in the free church. Was it Lee Trevino who used to say to his coach, uh, he used to go down to Florida every year and say, coach, teach me to play golf. However good we are, we can always be better. Uh, G.K. Chesterton, didn't he say that he thought golf was a rather expensive way to play uh, marbles? But that, that's an, another point. Every one of us could do with coaching. I, I cannot understand how someone could say, I don't need coaching. Maybe you're as good as you can be. That, that's tremendous. And the interesting thing is that uh, the, the folk who really seem to be in, engaged are very often the folk who are most open uh, to help. So we've, we've trained a number of men in gospel coaching. It's not a simple, simply a how-to thing. It goes into heart issues. And it coaches us through various things. So there's issues in your congregation. How do I effect change? How do I deal with difficult people? Uh, how do I embark in a meaningful strategy? Uh, all these things can you, someone can, can coach you through. Ecclesiastes 4.10, for if one falls down, his companion can lift him up, but pity the one who falls without another help him up. So these four things, church development track, rural ministry, um, annual survey, and coaching. Thank you. Thank you, David. I'll now ask uh, Neil to come up and speak about church plan. Uh, thanks uh, for the opportunity. A uh, suggestion for David, um, 500 pound bonus for ministers whose church fills in the health, health form. I think that would help with compliance. So uh, <laughs> personal bonus to every minister, 500 pounds So for the health survey. Um, it's great to be able to be up here and speak for a few minutes about church planting. Uh, our vision for growth as a denomination, we went through decades of decline, uh, which was arrested probably 15 years ago. We've, we're in a kind of plateau phase right now, statistically, as a denomination. But we do want to see uh, kingdom growth uh, for the good of the people of Scotland. 30-30 uh, was not my idea. Okay, so don't blame me. Um, the General Assembly of 2017 decided to adopt the 30 by 30 church planting project. And uh, the vision in church planting is for the whole nation. Uh, I want to say thank you and acknowledge the ministry of uh, Norman Mackay and Govan. Uh, Norman uh, poured his life out in Govan over the last decade and many others uh, saw their lives transformed and changed. So, Govan is still going. We're looking for a new minister, uh, and we want to move forward in Govan, but we do want to say thank you so much, Norman and Alison, for your great service to the church there. Um, okay. We want to plant in Wick or replant, radically revitalize uh, Wick. And so a shout out for Caithness as well. We care about every corner of the nation. Uh, Howard is working hard, a lonely task right up there on the north coast. Thurzo and Wick, both vacant, the next nearest minister down in Helmsdale with Roddy McRae. And uh, I'm told uh, by the guys up there that there are funds within the presbytery, and there is a large and beautiful mission field with thousands of people in need of the gospel. And so the Caithness cry is, we desperately need men and women to come and serve. And uh, I hope that some of you are listening. Who knows who might end up in Caithness serving the gospel? But I hope you are certainly praying uh, for the needs of the gospel up there. Um, I've got a few slides, um, and I'll run through them uh, if I can read them. Um, but I do want to say that uh, I've made some really important points. Um, we plant because we are confessional reformed Christians. 
We believe that mission is a covenantal obligation that God has given to His church, and uh, we live for His glory and His glory alone. And uh, we are deeply thankful for partner churches in the United States who help to make church planting possible, but we know that we don't want to be dependent on them forever. And the hope is that as new churches are brought into the denomination and grow and prosper, that will bring new money, new resources, uh, new ministers and leaders for the whole denomination. And one of the things that's been wonderful for me to see just over the last couple of years is uh, more and more of your congregations are kind of adopting church plants and partnering with them. And I'm really thankful to those of you uh, in churches of the Western Isles, in Aberdeen, Buclue and Edinburgh, other congregations who are not themselves church planting, but who are helping to fund, support, and pray for church plants happening in other parts of the country. So uh, the vision is 30 new churches between 2017 and 2030, and we believe church planting is worth the work, and it is hard work. We want to reach new people, new places, new generations, new cultures. As Scotland changes, I said this last night, I want to say it again today, Scotland is changing quickly. I'm going to be fascinated to see the census results that are going to come out from this year's census. I walk about Edinburgh and it's a different city from what I moved to 12 or 13 years ago. It looks different and it sounds different. And as we look at future mission, we want to think about how do we reach uh, those new cultures uh, for the gospel and how can those Christians coming from other cultures be part of the Free Church of Scotland. We do want to produce new leaders and resources that will strengthen the denomination nationally. And, uh, we want to be a blessing internationally as well. I think part of the 2017 vision was to support church planting internationally too. So let's see what we've got in the next slide. Uh, a board will not plant 30 churches. The mission board doesn't plant churches. And uh, I'm not going to plant 30 churches. Uh, local churches plant churches. So local congregations will start other congregations. And so I sat down uh, just over a year ago and tried to figure out what this might look like. And so we decided that we could have 14 church plants, hopefully from city congregations, city hubs that will plant multiple congregations. This congregation, St. Columbus, is on its fourth church plant in the last 10 years. And so we want other city center congregations to take up that challenge. And St. Columbus is here to mentor them in that process. Eight plants from current plants. Other churches uh, like uh, Burghead or Baclou might help with some of the church planting. Parachute plants where we just drop someone in uh, with no uh, obvious church uh, sending them out. Replants that David's mentioned. Skunk works. Uh, our number one skunk is uh, Ian McCaskill in NP500, giving somebody the freedom to try pioneering and innovative approaches. We've got 35 initiatives then planned uh, with the hope that out of those 35 initiatives, we'll see 30 healthy, flourishing new congregations for the denomination. That's a built-in failure rate of something like 12% or 14%. Let's pray that none of them fail, though. Right, let's see what's going on next. Okay, so just to say what happens, uh, I work around recruitment and helping to find the guys, the pipeline of men who will lead these church plants. Uh, Sarah Johnson helps organize assessment. Everybody who plants goes through an assessment process to ensure that they will be healthy as they plant that church, doing a good job. Healthy planters planting healthy churches. We don't want it to be an impossible task that breaks people. Tom Muir runs the training here in Edinburgh uh, using City to City Incubator. I think there's about half a dozen guys travel down once a month to spend the day with Tom in the training. It's a two-year training process. Sarah organizes coaching for every church planter, and then part of my work is uh, to raise money. We reckon this is going to cost us about £550,000 a year uh, over the next uh, number of years, and my job is to go out and uh, find that money uh, from wherever I can. So. Uh, do pray for that, and uh, as you think just about what Ivor said, 
there are at least 10,000 people the, in the denomination. If they're all giving £10 a week or £10 a month, it would make a huge difference. So we don't just need big churches and big donors. We do need uh, ordinary people giving generously. Let's go on. So I just want to acknowledge those who are our planters. Occasionally I wake up at night with a kind of cold sweat and fear thinking, what am I doing sending out all these poor guys planting churches? And uh, I worry about the task that they've been given. So um, Louise, my, my much better half, Louise, says men talk about church planting and women do it. So uh, as, as I... Um, Women are the relational ones generally when it comes to ministry. So, um, so as I, I mentioned the church plants we've got, I just want to acknowledge that uh, there are women involved doing great work. And uh, the, the women in, of, who are married to the planters all meet once a month uh, with Louise and with Katrina Lamont, and they have a time to pray together and talk together about what's going on in these situations. Church planting is no more special than any other kind of ministry. But it does have its own particular pressures and challenges. And so we want to care for our planters and their families as well as we can. So um, we've got Jonathan and Shona in Christchurch, Glasgow. Chris and Catherine up in Merkinch in one of our 20 Schemes plants. Uh, and then uh, we've got Andy and Kyrie in another 20 Schemes plant in Charleston. And uh, Ali and Julie down in Sewell, uh, Sewell, Sewell's in Haddington, thank you. And then Duncan and Lydia, so glad that the Helmsborough Church plant uh, just launched uh, at Easter time after a number of years of great work from Glasgow City. So there's another list of the planters there. Um, so Robin and Annabel, Robin's in the gallery. Uh, if you can track Robin down afterwards, He's wearing a kind of cream sweater. He's a bearded man with no hair on top. So look out for Robin, say hello to him, and let him know that you love him uh, as he plants. Just getting going out there in Winchborough to the west of Edinburgh. Hopefully you're seeing a bit of the demographic and geographic spread of different towns and different regions, different cities that we're planting in. Innes and Anna up in Tornagrain near Inverness. Craig and Amy, we haven't had a church in the borders I think for 87 years or 88 years or something like that, Craig and Amy uh, moving to Gala Shields with their children this summer for our first church on the borders in many generations. Kieran and Sarah Kelleher, Grace Church Montrose up in Angus, Ian and Anne, North Presbytery, Northern Presbytery 500 in Easter Ross, and then from Cornerstone, a great young couple, Jeff and Maddie. Uh, Jeff's a Pfeiffer and uh, was not brought up in a Christian home, converted in his late teens. Turned up at Cornerstone five years ago and said, I hear you guys plant churches. I want to plant a church. He's just graduating from UTS and we are thrilled to be sending him back to Fife to plant a church, working initially uh, with John uh, Johnson in uh, the Kirkcaldy congregation. Um, what's coming up? We're looking at Paisley. Gilmerton in Edinburgh, and Wick is high on our agenda as well. I think that might be all my slides, and I've run over time. So just uh, do keep all of that um, in your minds. There's a couple of other sides where we're going, geography and demography. We've got a spread across the, the country, but also into different kinds of communities, poor and wealthier. That's me. Sorry for going over. Thank you, Neil. Um, I would like to ask Martin now to come up and speak, but he's not a commissioner, uh, so conscious I need to... Martin Patterson. Yes. Martin Patterson's not a commissioner. Does he have the permission of the House to speak? Okay. Thank you. Well, good morning, um, moderator, uh, fathers and brothers. Let me uh, just first of all, uh, before I say anything else, say thank you for the opportunity to be able to address you 
and to be able to share a little bit about the work of uh, the gospel um, throughout the world uh, that we as a denomination are uh, being enabled to take part in. It's been a great privilege of mine over the last nine months or so to act as the global mission advisor to uh, the mission board of the Free Church of Scotland, and I have really enjoyed uh, my time doing that. If you want to know why I am no longer going to be doing that, you can look at the report and it will outline why that is the case. Uh, our family are getting ready to move uh, to Southeast Asia later this year, and we decided it was a good idea not to fly me back every month um, for the meetings. So, as a denomination, it is very clear that we are committed to uh, promoting and seeking gospel health amongst our churches. And to my mind, a key aspect and component of such gospel health is a resolute commitment to the fame of God's name among the peoples of the world. If we do not have that, we have lost something, and something of our health and vitality is no longer present. We are all rightly troubled about the spiritual condition of Scotland and the wider UK. However, we cannot diminish the reality that throughout God's world, there remain peoples and places where there is no access to a church, to a Bible, or to any believer who could point someone to Christ. If we are seeking gospel vitality, then our commitment to seeing this changed with the life and the gifts that God has given to us in this generation, well, it is an essential thing for us to take on board and to take seriously. However, what that looks like in many circumstances may have changed. We may have pictures and understandings of what we think gospel and global mission and ministry may look like, but that has changed significantly. We live in a generation where we can see before our eyes the promises of God coming to fulfillment. We can see the nations being gathered in. We can see something of that eschatological vision of the book of Revelation where people and nations and languages come to worship and love Christ as their Savior. If only sometimes we would just lift our heads up and see and be inspired and be encouraged by what God is doing. The growth of the church throughout the world is a cause for our rejoicing. It is also an opportunity for us as the church to learn and to partner with like-minded believers throughout the world. We have done that in the past. We continue to do that in the present. But as we move into the century laid out in front of us, there are great opportunities for us to think through what that looks like what it means for us to learn and to listen well to brothers and sisters throughout the world, to hear from different voices. That is something that we should learn to cultivate more and more. A way of doing this earlier on this year, we partnered with the Langham Partnership, which seeks to equip scholars, preachers, and theological educators throughout the world, and also OMF International in hosting um, the Filipino Old Testament scholar, Dr. Rico Villanueva who spent time in and around Scotland for a few days addressing the subject of how lament, addressing our pain before God, is a great opportunity for gospel mission and witness to a world which is in pain. If you want to, you can go online, both at Buclue and also Downvale. It was streamed live on their YouTubes. That is a great resource to turn to as a way to hear from someone outside of our context and building bridges into the communities that we find ourselves in. Part of our growth in gospel health, therefore, in the 21st century will be measured by our willingness to partner and to learn from these like-minded believers who also are people who hold to the faith that was once entrusted to the saints without paternalistic attitudes. We need help. We need to rely on others. We have much to offer to the global church, but we also have much to learn and much to grow in. At the 2010 Lausanne uh, Movement meeting in Cape Town, the general director of OMF International, Patrick Fung, Dr. Patrick Fung, commented on precisely this aspect of gospel growth in the church throughout the world. He said, reconciliation is the foundation of partnership and the cross is at its center. The cross symbolizes death and obedience to God, and true biblical partnership requires us to die to self. How well we all do that, eh? It may be to die to our own ambitions so that others may succeed, to die to 
our desires to be in key positions of influence so that others may take the lead. It could be to die to our own opinions for an insistence on how ministries should be run so that others can be used by God for a greater work. That's some 12 years ago, and it still resonates as strongly and clearly today as it did then. People movement is another way that we can see such changes taking place, the growth of the, go- the global church, but also the fact that people are moving throughout the world, and Neil has touched on this already. People are moving throughout the world rapidly. For example, look at point 11 in the, the, the reports, and we see the Lingards, a couple who have been sent out um, from Komali and Ardnamurk in Free Church. She is from Buenos Aires. He is from the West Country, uh, down south. They both met in Athens. He started working up in, uh, near Komali, near Fort William, and they've been sent out by this small church in a part of a small country to be involved in ministry to migrant peoples who have moved to the city of Athens with many challenges, many difficulties, and many frustrations. To me, that excites me. To me, that shows me the pattern which will become normal as we move into the 21st century in sending people out into mission. Many of these people that they have in front of them are in the hard-to-reach places of the Middle East or Central Asia, where traditional methods and means would be very difficult Um, to gain access to share the amazing message of Jesus. The McGilveries are another example of these changes. Having relocated in the providence of God, they now find themselves in a wonderful position where they are able to um, have flourishing ministry opportunities with, again, peoples that would have been difficult to get alongside. They never planned for this to happen, but the geopolitical movements of our world have meant that people move, and so they have great opportunities. And closer to home, The church's opportunities for witness to Christ among different peoples is only going to increase. I was listening to something just the other day, and it was in the context of London, but the the statistic was that in London, in your average Sunday morning, 51% of the people who gather for worship, their second language is English is their second language. That is going to be reflected in Scotland, particularly in places like Edinburgh and Glasgow and the Central Belt. That should be cause for great excitement. It's a great opportunity to reach peoples who maybe have never heard the name of Jesus. And yet, finally, the need remains. The need remains for the church globally to inspire, to identify, to equip, and to send some of their best people out for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. And that is a wonderful opportunity for us to grow in gospel health. Under God, we are given the the command, the responsibility, and the opportunity to raise up some amongst our churches who will be the next generation of global gospel workers serving the church, developing leaders, and sharing the gospel. And so for us, there is a challenge to live in the present with such future-focused audacity by releasing and resourcing some of our best people for the eternal well-being of many. I just want to say that I commend the report to the committee or to the assembly. And I also finally want to just say a word and give thanks to the Lord for our brother Clive Bailey. I didn't know Clive very long, but he was a great inspiration and encouragement to me in the journey that we are taking as a family. He is a brother who lived in the light of Christ's commission to see the peoples of the world come to know him, love him, and delight in him. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, The final speaker I'd like to ask to come up is Sarah. Uh, Again, she's not a commissioner, so she would need the permission. Does she have the permission of the house? And Sarah's going to speak uh, about the the equip stream. We've heard about global, we've heard about church development uh, and uh, church planting. There's a quiet uh, little pocket of people uh, within the the mission board who seek to try to put resources in the hands of uh, folks in the congregations to to help us in our walk with God. Uh, and um, they're very industrious, very quiet. And this is just a little about uh, what's happened over the last uh, year. So, Sarah, please. Thank you. Uh, 
The Church Equipping Group uh, aims to provide resources that can be used by all disciples of all ages to walk with Jesus. In the past year, we were very sorry uh, to say goodbye to Kirsten MacDonald, Karina McKeever and Mary McPherson. But we were delighted to welcome Mary Beaton and Anne MacDonald to the Equip Group. In partnership with the ETS Mission Centre, the group have worked on four resource packs and we hope that the two of these packs will be uh, on one-to-one -one discipleship and on youth fellowship will be available uh, in printed format and in PDF format uh, this coming autumn. We hope too that two further resource packs uh, will be available on partnering with parents and on women's ministry um, and these will be available uh, in the autumn of 2023. Um, there has been a lot of positive feedback uh, on Billy Graham's uh, Walk With Me Daily devotions and we are delighted that these helpful devotions will soon be available as a book as well as being available on email. Churches and individuals have the opportunity um, to purchase these and uh, we think they're going to make a wonderful Christmas gift uh, this year. Um, so as a group, we continue to support uh, the free church youth camps and also the Big Free Rally. Um, sorry. And uh, also provide resources for the National Day of Prayer, which this year is planned, I think, for Wednesday the 30th of November. So as a group, we continue to support the work of the Free Church Youth Conference, but feedback has suggested uh, that a specific conference for teenagers would be helpful. So we are planning and preparing um, for an upper secondary age uh, conference called the Teens Conference in June of 2023. There is um, a growing interest among women across our denomination to dig deeper into the Bible, and it is hoped uh, that a Bible theology workshop led by Na Nancy Guthrie will take place on Saturday the 2nd of September in Inverness. Our Inspire Ministers Wives Conference took place this year again as a hybrid a conference and we have another one planned for 2023. Um, on our website you'll find Gaelic Sunday School uh, resources, the links have been uploaded and in coming weeks and months we hope to be able to provide links to English resources as well with um, a paragraph and a brief review of what each of these are about. Um, so if you're looking for materials, please have a look at our website. You'll also find um, certificates that can be shared with your Sunday school children at the end of this year, if that's helpful for you. Um, finally, there has been ongoing um, liaison with our Christian Education Steering Group, and I think you'll hear more about that uh, this afternoon. Um, I've really been speaking on behalf of Ali MacDonald, who has chaired this group. So I think on behalf of the mission board, we just want to thank Ali for all her hard work in uh, leading this group. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah. And uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, we may have gone slightly over. And if we have, I uh, apologize uh, for that. Uh, and conscious questions are coming, uh, but if possible, moderator, uh, it would be good to be able to clarify uh, the wording of one uh, section of the report. I don't know if that's in order or not. If you wish to clarify the wording, then go ahead. Okay. It's uh, page 36, um, and it is the deliverance, proposed deliverance in relation to North Uist, Grimsey and Burnery. And uh, essentially it's permission just to change the wording to reflect the change in circumstances. Uh, the Reverend Callum Murdo-Smith uh, is moving in the direction of uh, Stornoway. And so essentially what we're doing is we're taking his name from the deliverance. I think it's going to be on the screen, uh, but if, if it's helpful, I can, I can read the, the, uh, the proposed wording at this point. Do you want me to read that? Or? That's what, uh, sorry, Mario, that, that, that's uh, the wrong slide that's on. Okay. Yeah, that's it now. Do we okay. have it now? That's okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it would be helpful if you just okay, yeah, so read it. Okay, so the proposed deliverance, uh, replacing what was there before in section C, paragraph 2, 
uh, says, the General Assembly received a petition of the Presbytery of Western Isles regarding the five-year terminable renewable appointment of the Minister in the Congregation of North East, Grimsey and Burnery, and noting the recommendation of the Mission Board grant its crave. They grant the Congregation the status of a fully sanctioned charge, they note the impending vacancy in the Congregation, and they declare that the future Minister's appointment be without restriction according to the provisions of Act 1, Class 1, 2018, and then the Sustentation Fund. So you're really bringing it up to date then yeah. in view of Callum Murdo Smith's acceptance of the Stornoway call. That's yeah, right, yeah. That's fine. So I take it that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so do we have questions for uh, David or anyone else? Uh, any questions? No questions. Benjamin Wilkes, please. Moderator, page 26 of the uh, Mission Board report uh, under the heading Church Planting, the first paragraph concludes, it is clear that as the work continues to expand that the role of Church Planting Director requires more than two days a week. Um, certainly uh, from my perspective uh, in Glasgow and Argyll, we're very grateful for Neil's work as the Church Planting Director um, and his help with various plants uh, existing and ongoing. I don't doubt the statement, um, but I guess my question is what, uh, th there isn't kind of evidence for that statement in the report, so it'd be helpful to know what has led to that conclusion. And there also doesn't seem to be a plan for how that might actually be achieved um, for the role to have more than two days a week. Does the board have specific plans um, or what might that might look like? Thank you for the question. Um, I think you're asking about evidence, first of all, that takes us to the, uh, the statement and uh, the, the plans for the way ahead. I think in terms of evidence, probably uh, we're just conscious of how stretched uh, our church planting director is, uh, Neil is. Uh, there has been points where uh, we've been concerned just with the workload and how he's uh, able to manage that uh, alongside uh, serving within uh, Cornerstone. I don't know if Neil would want to speak to that himself. He can have the opportunity maybe to do that after, uh, after myself. In, in terms of a plan for the way ahead, uh, I think I would need to be upfront and say we don't have a plan uh, at this point in time. Uh, we recognise that there's an increasing need as the, the numbers build, um, but there is no clear uh, plan and map for the way ahead. And obviously, if there was to be a, uh, a requirement for more than two days a week, that would have financial implications and it would involve more than just us as a, as a mission board. Okay. So I think David wants to contribute. Yep. Perhaps Neil does as well, if that's in order. Well, the, the answer, or part of the answer to the question is that a lot of the financial arrangements are uh, shared with the Board of Trustees who have a final say, and the Board of Trustees have increased uh, the grant allow that to take place so that's part of your question answered so a lot of the financial issues uh, you appreciate uh, are signed off by the board of trustees so it's perhaps a question that you can also ask at their report okay any other questions oh sorry Neil. I'm, I'm just going to make a brief comment which is i think i think it's a fair question and we haven't job sized it in any kind of specific way but certainly I'm aware that there's a lot of gaps in what I do and that the support that the current planters are getting is inadequate. Um, we need to recruit another sort of 20 people. That's quite a big task. Uh, we need to raise five million pounds, quite a big task. Uh, the clerk has been begging me for a couple of years to bring forward better legislation around church planting. I need to put a manual together to show uh, just good processes. So, in other words, when we're planting one church a year or whatever, ad hoc worked okay. You know, we could do it all in the back of an envelope kind of thing. Now it's becoming, we need to have much better systems and processes. Uh, and there's a, 
a lot of work that's done, you know, in terms of administering, financing, processing all of this. Uh, I certainly don't want to spend more than two days a week on it, but I think there's a job there for somebody else. Uh, my, my love and my delight is local church ministry, and uh, being, the, being the minister of Cornerstone is, is what matters most to me, but I'm happy to serve the church in the church planting role uh, for a day or two a week as long as I can. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Neil. Father's uh, brothers, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Neil Graham back. Um, I'd like to uh, ask one question. I think I might know the answer already too, but it's um, regarding what David Merritt has brought up uh, on the congregational service. Now, we have every few years people are being set aside as a denomination for the numbers that I attend. But uh, okay. like this year, we had a, a questionnaire sent out plus with the, with the um, with the a section where you had to put in the number of adherents, the number of members, and the age groups. Now, I've been a, I've been a treasurer as well as an elder. I've been a treasurer for, I don't know how I many, 15 years or so and back. And over the years, when we've had that survey brought out, I've been asked to look through the number of contributors to the church and take an estimate from that as to how many adherents we have, etc. And it's always been a lot higher than we see the attendance. Uh, this year, when we did it, um, I was asked to do the same again, and the number of communicants would come from the role. But I suggest, why don't we just count them? How many people there are Sunday morning, and how many additional ones there are Sunday evening? And we, as office bearers, as, de as elders, we know who's missing. We can add them in, and we'll know exactly how many people, different individuals turn up on the Lord's Day, and it came to about 260 odd, which is about right, I think. And we split them up between uh, adherents and uh, members. Now, the number of, of, of communicant members we have in the role is in excess of 200, and we know that there's fewer than 200 attending church on Sunday. And I know as well from hearing from ministers that they are asked to preach as a congregation right, with their own denomination and they look up the service to see how many they expect to attend and sometimes fewer than half the people that they expect are there. Mm -hmm. um, we put out, this year, we put out, I think... Sorry, can, can I... The, can co I the question's you? coming. Yeah, okay. The question's <laughs> coming. <laughs> this year we, we put down, uh, you know, on that Sabbath we had, live, we were live streaming, 42 devices watched it in the morning from start to finish live and didn't move out at all. 30 in the evening. I know a lot of these are communicant members who are not fit to attend church anymore and their family members who are now stay at home to help them with the devices. And I know that our session clerk sent down two lists of statistics. The actual number who attend and the actual number on the roll. What is it exactly does the vision board want? Okay. Uh, Mr. Meredith, I think gonna, he's who's probably... Who's going to answer that? Going to relish this one. I was getting the answer as the question was being asked. So um, there's there's two different questions. There's one, how many members? That's a fixed thing. And there's also a second question, how many on that particular day? Um, so that's what was the question? Someone was else. Yeah, we, we don't, we just want to know, the f no, on that particular day, we just want to know how many people were there, maybe screens, maybe in person. I think there's a, there is a section that asks on one particular day, uh, Sarah yeah. is, is, is the brains behind this. Maybe you want to answer the question. Neil, if you want to continue uh, the, the questioning, then you're going to have to come out. Okay. Okay. Let me see if I can answer this. But I think on the paper, there is uh, a table that asks for all the numbers of adherents, members, and that's where you give the full number of who you, who you know is a 
part of your congregation. Now, this year and last year, we didn't ask for a, a survey of who was in your church. So we've not done that this year or last year because you had a lot of online things. Moving forward this year, we're going to send the survey out in October and then in November there's going to be that checking each day of who's going to be there. So it'll change again for this year. Okay, all right. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, uh, James Fraser. Moderator, fathers and brethren, my question, oddly enough, is about the stats as well. Um, some churches have experienced the phenomenon that they have people who communicate regularly and who are almost identical to church members, but they don't want to be members of a congregation for various reasons and are very difficult to persuade that they should be. <clears throat> Do we collect that Christian strength that's still in our congregations, in our stats? And if not, would you give consideration as to how you might deal with that in future? Because if we simply count in these congregations, <coughs> people who are on communion rolls, <coughs> pardon me, we're underestimating the Christian strength of the congregation. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, it's certainly something that can be considered. I don't know whether you want to respond to it in detail. <coughs> well, I think the answer is that that sort of thing cannot be readily identified on a statistic. You know, someone um, in, in metrics, we, we call them, there's probably two, three hard metrics in a church situation. Communicants, that's fixed. We know that. Money, that's fixed. We, we know that and number of people in a day that's fixed, and, and we know that. The nuances is that's one of the great things that you could do in, in the discussion. So someone may be an adherent, but maybe a believer. That's not something that's of statistical relevance, but it's of great spiritual relevance for the discussion in, in the congregation. So we couldn't, it would be really complex if we put another, you know, on a scale of one to nine, how spiritual is this? Adherent, you know, uh, it would be really difficult to, to analyze that. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Yep. Brian. Fathers and brethren, um, uh, Brian Morton from uh, Elder from Covenant Church, New Mills. Um, Forgive my ignorance, I, I hope it's a simple question. On page 32 of the report in the uh, Section 3 Global Mission Annual Grant Amounts Table, um, the uh, column for the support for Reverend Suraj Kasula in Nepal says TBC for to be confirmed. And I just wondered if there was a particular reason for that. Um, and it may be that I've missed it somewhere else in the report. So that was just a clarification for me on that one. Thank you. <clears throat> I thought someone would ask that, that question. Uh, the, the reason is that there was other information that we had to find out. For example, um, most missionaries are funded on a kind of portfolio basis. We needed to find out what his, who his other partners were, and I think that information has now come, and we will be able to allocate a grant on that basis. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, William Fraser, Plotman and Kyle. Uh, just a quick question regarding the Generation podcast, which we as a congregation found very uh, useful and helpful, and just uh, whether it will be continuing uh, in the future. I think I can say it will be continuing, and uh, maybe you'll get a, a sales pitch for what's coming just in a moment. <laughs> well, the, the, the answer is yes and no. The Generation podcast has come to an end, but you'll see that the whole generation brand uh, has been given a little bit more definition. So we will be having a new podcast 
Uh, I don't think we'll call it generation continuing. That may not be good. <laughs> but uh, so we'll be having a new con uh, 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 podcast. We've already got the first two speakers lined up. Um, so that will be relaunched. It will be given an, another name. But thank you for the encouragement that you are listening. We've got uh, a good uh, listenership and we hope to develop that and make it even stronger. We're working on a name for that just now um, and that will be out in the next few weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Colin. Colin McLeod back, Isla Lewis. David, would you undertake to live stream the rural conference that's scheduled because the last one wasn't live streamed and it would be very helpful given current travel dilemmas in our nation if it could be live streamed. <laughs> Just stay there. Mother, the plan is not to live stream it. We did want to put the emphasis on people uh, actually coming. I know there's a degree of irony there that in a rural thing that you don't live stream. So we took that, that decision, but we will note your concern. Anyone else? Any other questions? Okay, I don't see any other hands up. Okay, I think I've given enough opportunity. We Now, has the report been uh, moved? No. Are you going to move? So I'll now move this report as in the assembly papers and uh, I have a seconder in Neil McMillan. Yep. Formally seconded. Okay. So the report has been moved and seconded. We come now to consider an amendment uh, under the name of Duncan McPherson. You'll find that on the purple sheet. Duncan, would you please speak to the amendment? We had a discussion this morning. You wondered whether to take this in camera. Well, my understanding is that, you're, that, that this is a, a more general amendment. There are no names mentioned. Well, it'll, it'll be a rise, it arises from a specific person that illustrates a principle, and therefore I think it would either be useful from my point of view if perhaps a live stream was suspended. Well, if it's a personal matter, it would have to be in camera. Um, if, 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 we're going to, if we're going to talk about specific pension provision for a person, yeah. then it would have to be in camera. Yeah, so we're, we're, Audrey, we need to, to cut the live stream and, and go into camera for, for the presentation of the amendment. Yeah. Um, so how, can I ask you this honestly, how necessary is it for you to, to, to go into personal details? I think in order for people to understand the principle, it's necessary to go into yeah. detail. Would you agree on that one, David? I th think so, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it would be helpful uh, to be in camera uh, for, for this one because it, it, it comes from a, a personal situation but it highlights a principle. Yeah, I think it's, Mother, I think it's going to be impossible to explain the amendment without personal reference. Really. Okay. Yeah. Well, I apologise <laughs> for all those who are, are, are not members. I'm afraid you're going to have to vacate the room. And we're going to have to cut the live stream. With the permission of the House. With the permission of the House.
Uh, are, are we ready for James to speak? Okay. A moderator, fathers and brethren, um, looking at this report, I, I had a conversation with the convener uh, yesterday uh, because I worried at the ambiguity of this part of the deliverance. And I wasn't terribly sure what was being asked for. And I now know what the convener intended to ask for, but I don't necessarily believe the words actually do that. If you ask somebody to make budgetary provision, they can do that in several ways. They can find new money that wasn't in anybody's budget, or they can find some new money that wasn't in anybody's budget, and they can cull the other budgets and find the rest of the money. Or they could say to the mission board, well, we'll contribute X pounds of new money, but you must bear the Y pounds that's required to have a full-time worker from your own budget. And when I asked the convener what he'd intended, the intention of this was to ask for new money, not to ask for money to be recycled from existing budgets. Now, if that's the intention, then I think it would be better to state it. And my amendment simply seeks to state that intention, so that instead of asking the Board of Trustees to make budgetary provision for the employment of a full-time worker, and I believe the convener estimates the cost at £30,000 per annum, uh, my amendment instructs the Board of Trustees to make additional funds available to meet the full cost of the employment of the worker for the 12 month period, et cetera, et cetera. That's all my amendment seeking to do. I hope I've explained it. Um, and uh, there it is. Happy to take questions. Any questions for James? Okay, do we understand the proposal, the amendment? Okay. No questions. Yep, Benjamin. I'm trying, I'm really trying not to keep coming up. I am. <laughs> However, they instruct the Board of Trustees to make additional funds to meet the full costs of the employment of a full-time worker. I'm sure we would all be delighted if the Board of Trustees had the capacity to make funds. However, I'm not sure that's quite what you intend. Should this not be allocate additional funds or make additional funds available or I don't think the Board of Trustees... That, that's not a mind. question, Benjamin. That, yeah, that's a suggestion. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I thought it was a question. Is, is what is written here what you intended to write? That's my question. <laughs> It's what I intended to write, but that's not what I thought your question was when you, when you started your question. I think it means the same thing as make available, but you may think I was careless in the way okay. it was set out. I think the point is the word available is missing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. It is. Okay. Um, Donald. Moderator, the £30,000 estimate, is that the anticipated salary, or is that the anticipated salary plus national insurance, pension costs, etc.? I, I didn't hear that. Oh, sorry, Donald, could you I'm, repeat I'm sorry, that? I, I, it's I, very I, low. I had difficulty was it hearing it. Was it a question? Yes. The, yes sorry, Donald. The figure you quoted of £30,000 as yes. the cost, is that... £30,000 the anticipated salary, or is it £30,000 the cost of the, 
the salary, including employers' mass insurance, pension costs, and other own costs? I would have to ask the, um, the chairman of the board which of these two uh, things he was referring to, because uh, the question there is quite right. It is a different figure if it's simply the salary. The it, cost is a different it figure. It doesn't actually say 30,000, does it? No, it doesn't, but I said this. The point Donald's making is I, I, the convener told me that the cost of this was 30,000 pounds. Donald is asking, is that the man's yeah. salary yeah. or the cost it would be to fund a £30,000 salary? Yeah. Yeah. And that I think the convener can answer. Okay, any other questions? But would it be helpful if the convener now answered that question? Because we haven't answered that question. Hey. Where is the convener? Convener? can answer that question in as much as that's the figure I was told by uh, a principal clerk <laughs> uh, who will speak to this uh, later in the day because he's been overseeing the Christian education uh, section. Maudie, the, the, the figures given were, were presented by Christian Values in Education Scotland and as far as I understand it, 30k is the total cost of employing a worker for the 12 months. Thank you. Okay. That's your question. Any other questions? Okay. If there are no other questions, are you going to move? I move. Okay. Do we have a seconder? Yep. We have a seconder. Okay. Thank you. All right. It's, it's moving with the, with the addition of the word available. I mean, yeah. Sorry. I have to speak up. Available, the, yes, uh -huh. yeah. yes, yes, yes. To make additional funds happy. available, right, okay. Uh, that, that, that's fair enough. I think we all understand that. Okay, so we have the two amendments and we have the deliverance. Um, do we have speakers to the report? I think this is a great opportunity now to have a, a general uh, reflection on the mission board and the report. Anything you wish to comment on? Um, those of you who are uh, more involved in the mission board activity than others, uh, or even those who aren't, it, this, is a, this is the core work of the church. Um, so I would hope that there were... Sandy Finlay, please. Sandy Finlay, uh, Free North, Inverness. Uh, yes, I want to uh, speak a little bit about the section there in the church equipping, and specifically this matter that we've just been thinking about under Christian education. I'm delighted that the Assembly has finally, last year, uh, taken up this matter and is now showing a concern for education in uh, this country. For a long time, we, we've left it to individuals or organizations, other organizations, to uh, champion the, the rights of, of Christians and, and Christian teaching Christian values. And uh, many people have seen it as a kind of either-or, so that we, we either engage in the, in the propagation of the gospel or we, we get involved in, in a challenging authority and engaging with authority. I don't see it as an either-or. We need to do both. During the last decade, we've seen a rising tide of uh, material that is dangerous and damaging um, and that is decidedly non-Christian as far as a, a, a schools go. Lovewise, who are a Christian charity in the north of England, comment on the material in the following way. A non-biblical worldview rejects the understanding of marriage as the proper God-given place for sexual intimacy and the appreciation that people are created male and female with distinct, immutable differences between the two. Last year, that organization contributed an article to the, the church's uh, magazine, to the record, offering help and support. 
And they were very disappointed in the response uh, from our people. Uh, so much so that the, the comment was made by somebody in the organization, do the people of Scotland not care? And so we asked the question, do we care about our young people, and not just our young people, but about the young people of Scotland? I hope that we do. And I think that the material that's before you here in, in paragraph 10 uh, demonstrates that there is a, a degree of concern, but I'm not sure how widespread it is. The action that we are proposing and, and that's being uh, taken uh, as a church nationally has to be matched by what we do locally. It's not enough just to sit back and let others uh, engage in this. It is something that we have to do at a local level. Parents need to be informed. Parents need to be supported. It may be necessary for others to take um, action on their behalf, to act as advocates uh, so that representation can be made to schools, uh, to the local authority, to officials, uh, and to councillors. We need to engage with these people. One of the buzzwords in society and in education is inclusion. Well, we need to play that card. We need to say that what we expect and what we demand uh, for our children is that they are included and that they are not presented with material that is uh, offensive and contrary to Christian teaching. And so as parents and grandparents, uh, we need to be active in this way. We must be prepared for a long haul. It's not going to happen quickly. But we need to be active at every level so that we can turn uh, the, the tide. Lovewise, the, the charity I've mentioned have resources available, and I'll put out some of their literature at the back on the table uh, for you uh, to take up if you wish. Thank you very much. Informed that you should not have devices in the assembly. Sorry. Were you not informed that you should not have devices in the assembly? Yeah. Uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of a suitable response to that. But, uh, okay, yes, my apologies first of all, but I am replying to Sharon Fraser, <laughs> if that's a good excuse, which I think it is, and that's uh, where it will begin and end. I do apologize. Um, Charlie Douglas, please. Thank you. There's a few thoughts going around my head, um, so I'll just start with Neil. Um, you mentioned cross-cultural experience and one or two experiences he's had cross-culturally. Uh, some of you know I've had a cross-cultural experience. Soon we're going to move house after 35 years in Company Bank. We're going to Christorfen and uh, we've been clearing out and one, amongst the things that I found was a photograph taken in 1977 when the late Principal Cameron and uh, the late Professor Fraser, uh, along with David and Marion Fraser, we were all presented at that 1977 assembly to have that cross-cultural experience. And I really valued that experience. And as Neil said, um, it, it opens you up to new experience and it never changed me for life and um, I once said to Ivor you should budget within the ETS a cross-cultural experience for all students <laughs> so maybe that might not be within the budget to go abroad but it is of great value to have a cross-cultural experience um, so that's one thing I wanted to mention about the importance of cross-cultural experiences. Another thing was Neil uh, mentioned, I think, that was church plants. Now, Elder Moral Leith has changed down through the 50 years that I've been there. But 50 years ago, uh, we planted a church in Livingston. 
And it's so it's it's great to have had that experience. It's a pity you're not planning one in Kerstorfen. <laughs> but anyway, that might that may be. So it's useful to have that experience of being involved in planting the Livingston Church in the early 1970s and visiting the communities there and, and how, I think if I'm right in saying Livingston then planted Falkirk, is that true? So, so it shows that, um, I think that's part of Neil's hope that church planting moves on uh, uh, and once a church is planted, they can then uh, move on to church another, uh, plant another church. Also, uh, also wanted to mention when I first met Neil. Uh, um, I first met Neil in a high, highways and byways mission when we came back from Peru in 1986. I wanted to be involved after being so involved abroad. So as soon as we're back. They wanted folk to go up to Castletown. And I'll never forget, if I'm right in saying, uh, Neil partnered with, with me to go to Wotton. And I'll never forget all the doors in that community opened to us and we were invited into all the houses. It was such a great experience. So I wouldn't like the mission board to forget highways and byways <laughs> and, the, and the impact that it did have in, in these years and the usefulness it had. Maybe you should consider something similar. Uh, I think it changed its name after a few years, but it's, to me it seems to have kind of uh, been lost. So maybe it's something you could consider, because I found these... Uh, I did a previous one in the Isle of Mull um, in 1976. So that's a, both these experiences were very positive. So I just want to say that. But the point, the only word I wanted to mention when I came up here was the word kakamarka. And it actually appears on page 33 of your report, 12.2. And I want to thank the board for the decision to hand over the property in kakamarka. And I want to thank them for that. But also to highlight there's still other properties that needed to be done. <laughs> and to encourage them to look into that. There's quite a few properties under the trustees still in the area, so I encourage you. But thank you for handing over Kakamarka. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Andy Pearson, please. <clears throat> Fathers and brethren, Andy Pearson, uh, St. Peter's, Dundee. Uh, I've just been asked to speak for a couple of minutes about uh, my own experience, our congregation's experience of having the mission director, Mr. Meredith, uh, uh, come along and help us out. Um, you may not know me, uh, many of you, but I have recently taken on a new charge in Dundee, having been in London for a uh, kick in 10 years something like that. Uh, so moving in a new charge, you can imagine uh, the to-do list is long. What to focus on? One of the things that I wanted to focus on was the actual courts of the church. So how is the Kirk session functioning? How are the deacon's court functioning? Did these men love each other? Was there a lot of prayer? Was there a clear biblical vision uh, for what these courts should be doing I don't know if you would agree with this or not, uh, but in my experience, uh, congregations, office bearers can have a more biblically defined view of the eldership than of the deacon's court. Uh, we can have our eyes down in the deacon's court just to the light bulbs and maintenance of buildings rather than following Jesus as, as the servant. Uh, so I wanted to see some training done for the diaconate, for the deacons of the church. Now, uh, I love deacons training. Uh, I do it myself. Sometimes it's great to have in-house training, isn't it? Uh, but also sometimes it's nice to have a voice from outside come in. I had heard on the grapevine uh, that David had done uh, leadership training elsewhere, I think also outside of the denomination, uh, so I rather boldly asked him if he would come along to St. Peter's and provide some diaconate training uh, for our court 
first thing to say was that he was incredibly willing. Uh, he's a busy man. He does not just sit in a tower in Edinburgh concocting horrible surveys for churches to fill in. He doesn't. He's a busy man, uh, but immediately willing to come along to St. Peter's. We spent a Saturday morning together at the Deacon's Court. David did a really excellent presentation uh, for the court. He then uh, facilitated a really helpful discussion, and it was clearly helpful for our deacons. And he spent good time uh, with the court and then left. Uh, I needed to follow that up. This is no criticism whatsoever, but it's one thing to think about the deacon's court biblically, then to think about what it looks like on the ground for our own particular context and congregation. But it was really easy to follow up after what David had done. Um, and so perhaps we're thinking of the mission director as looking at particular types of congregations. Uh, but I want to say for uh, St. Peter's, it was really helpful. I want to commend that sort of thing to you. Give David a, a shout. Um, and that's basically all I have just to say thank you to David. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Tom Muir. Uh, moderator, uh, congratulations again and thank you. And fathers and brothers, my name is Tom Muir and um, I'm a part of Esk Valley Church, which is a church plant. So it's been suggested to me that I just say a couple of words to update you on how things are going. But I'd like to just say a couple of things with reference to what we've been talking about over the course of the morning. And I think something that's really struck me personally, as we've heard from Neil last night and Ivor this morning and different things that have been said, uh, and something that I'm really helped by is the sense of togetherness and unity, the ways in which we are one church, working together with the same aim, sharing different experiences, but genuinely helping each other. Uh, and so, first of all, what I'd like to do is just touch on something David Meredith mentioned, which is coaching. So Andy was just talking a minute ago about having David come to talk in his own capacity and the way in which that was helpful to him and to our congregation. Personally, I've found coaching to be helpful, despite the fact that it involved Neil McMillan, but I do feel that his coaching helped me. Uh, I've come through the experience and I'm still processing things. Um, and the reason it was helpful is because sometimes we can feel like we're doing things by ourselves. And we do get a bit stuck. Coaching doesn't supersede uh, the way in which God can lead us at our personal, local level in terms of what we preach. It doesn't supersede any decisions made by the local courts. It simply is somebody coming alongside, not to tell you what to do, uh, but to simply help you consider the angles, the jumble that you may feel you're in, to, to work your way through that thread a little bit, and to ask, really, how can we move forward with a particular challenge? So I just want to commend coaching. It's helpful. It's a way of thinking outside the box, and it's a way of learning from, sharing experience, learning from somebody else. Second thing I wanted to mention briefly was uh, community. This is really just on the same theme. Uh, we can sometimes compartmentalize, can't we? Uh, we can feel like we're only uh, in our own little corner of the world. We can feel like we're only a part of our own, if you like, discipline within the wider body of the church. So I'm a part of a church plant, but I don't just feel like a church planter. Um, it, David mentioned in his report that uh, he was advised always to stick close to Jesus. Of course, we're plugged into the source at all times, and we go awry if we're not. Neil McMillan told me, one of his gems, was if you try and plant a church by your own gifts and abilities, you will come unstuck. So, of course, we need to be plugged into the Lord Jesus, but we also need to be plugged into one another in meaningful ways and in ways which we can share. And, you know, one of the things I've really enjoyed reading the report, the Mission Board report, seeing pics on Facebook or however the information is transmitted in conversations, is hearing from guys on the development track, for example. But there are other things I could mention just now. And I find that encouraging because I do believe, somebody mentioned it, I can't remember who it was, 
that though we have distinct elements to the challenges and the congregations and the situations we face, we're basically doing the same job. We're seeking to hold out the wonderful Lord Jesus in different and variously challenging circumstances. And I genuinely believe we can, I can learn from the guys on the development track. I can learn from the guys in the city center churches. I can learn from Martin Patterson going out to Southeast Asia. And there's a wonderful sense of the way in which with all the different challenges we face, we can get behind one another. And uh, so I enjoy that very much. I was going to get escorted off the stage there for a moment. <laughs> so the church development track, let me just say, if you're on it, I hope it's going really well, and I'm encouraged by seeing what's going on there. I, I will touch on our own, within the church planting worlds, the sense of uh, collegiality and getting together. It was mentioned that I'm in charge of training, which makes it sound like I know what I'm doing. I confess that I often don't. But again, what happens at that uh, meeting is, uh, so again, some of the names that were up on, this, on the screen earlier that Neil shared, uh, different guys who are starting out on the church planting process where I was and we were seven years ago. Uh, we get together in a room once a month and uh, I lead, I guess, using information that's been collated from different sources. The city to city material is very helpful. But the brilliant thing about it is we get in the room, a guy who's starting a church in Inverness, a guy on Helensburgh, a guy in the west of Edinburgh, a guy who's got the borders, uh, and a couple of other people, not even just from the free church. And we use the material, but we share collective experiences, we bless one another, we collectively reach out to the Lord Jesus. So again, just that sense of being able to share experiences and encourage one another uh, in the different situations that we face. I find that really encouraging, and I hope those on the incubator uh, the church plant training track do too. And finally, let me say uh, a little bit about Esk Valley. 30 by 30 is an endeavor to try and plant uh, more church plants. We actually don't fit within that 30 number because we were planted just before that idea was conceived. But where we're at just now is we love to be able to contribute to it by planting our own church. I say that every so often in the church, just to keep that on the agenda, just to keep it on people's radars. We're not able to at the moment, but we'd love to be able to. And the way we'd like to be able to do that is, as I said already, by staying plugged in to the Lord Jesus and to the gospel, of course, but also by laying a strong foundation. So again, referring to some of what the moderator spoke about uh, this morning, it is really important for us to have a strong sense of what it means to become a local church, to become a standalone church. That's something that we've just expressed to our uh, local church plan. Uh, to become a standalone church financially, to have more elders, these are all things on the radar. So for your encouragement from being a very small handful about seven years ago, we're now a church of around 90 regular people. The challenge we face is a great challenge. It's that 40 of those are children. Uh, so I'm very thankful for that, but that means that a lot of our people are stretched in terms of uh, providing ministry and support to families and to those children. So do continue to pray for us. Uh, that's an encouraging number, but we still face many challenges. We don't have our own building. We don't have our own manse. And so we do have to raise a considerable amount of money to pay for that, like many churches face their own challenges. That's just a little bit about my own experience, my own encouragement, and I do hope uh, I've uh, conveyed the sense of encouragement. It feels to be a part of a body who are different, but working towards uh, a common goal, of course, and helping one another along the way. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, I was a very intermittent coach, I have to confess, um, but I'm also very glad to you for doing the training. Much appreciated. Uh, Jonathan De Groot, uh, come on down. Lachie's got his hand up as well. Who else is wanting to speak? Plenty of people want to speak. Good. Um, get the church planters out of the way first and then move on to the grown-ups. Moderator, brethren, thank you very much to the convener of the mission board and to the mission board for an excellent report on mission. Neil McMillan had asked if I would give a, a snapshot, really, of Christchurch Glasgow, which is a, a church plant, as you know, of Glasgow and Argyll Presbytery. Also, gratefully, he did give me a bit of advance warning about speaking to 
this topic today, um, because the first time I heard that I was supposed to give thanks to him for his year as moderator was when I was called to give thanks to him for his year as moderator last night. So grateful for a bit more warning this time, although it was over uh, chicken pakora last night at the city chambers at the moderator's reception, so uh, a bit more warning this morning um, by a text message about half an hour ago. So just to say a few things about Christchurch Glasgow and also the wider perspective of church planting within the Free Church. Um, I am new to the Free Church of Scotland. This is my first in-person General Assembly and it's great to be here. But what excited me about joining the Free Church of Scotland and leaving the Church of Scotland was this vision for 30 by 30. And so David Meredith and Neil McMillan met with me and explained their vision for planting new churches. And based in Glasgow, I said, well, what's the, the vision for what is going to happen in Glasgow? And he said, well, we're still working on it, but why don't you pull a plan together and discuss it and we'll see what happens. And so that was the start, late 2017, uh, in thinking through how we could reach more people with the good news of Jesus in Glasgow. We did launch Christchurch Glasgow in 2019, in September, and it's been a combination of the mission board of Coat Bridge Free Church, who are our mother church, and also the presbytery in Glasgow. And our vision all along has been to be a church that's not just for ourselves, but for those who wouldn't normally go to church. And so what we try to do, and all we do, is to make everything as accessible as possible so that we can clearly proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to those who don't know him. And from the start, really we've been seeking to develop a healthy church culture, a DNA, that really is to see the good news of Jesus spread amongst our relations, amongst our neighbors, amongst our work colleagues. And so we've seen our churches being not just about trying to gather people in, but to send people out scattered throughout the week to share the message of Jesus with their, their unbelieving friends, colleagues, and family. And from the very beginning, our aim has been to try and be a church plant that plants churches, that plant churches, very much what Tom was saying and what Neil was saying earlier. And we're so grateful to God for what he has done in the past, and we look forward with excitement to what he will do in the future. And God willing, the next phase of our development as a church plant is to move from church plant to fully sanctioned charge. And so we're in the midst of filling out the sustentation fund schedule to go to the mission board to be looked at. And from the beginning of our church plant, our people have always been aware that we don't just exist for ourselves, but in time, we want to send people out. And so, all being well, God willing, when we become a fully sanctioned charge, our people will be thinking, okay, where next and who is going to go? And I think it's so important because with churches rapidly closing in Scotland, I think the latest estimation I, I heard was 120 churches close every year in Scotland, but it's probably more than that now, then 30 by 30 might seem ambitious, but actually 30 by 30 isn't enough to redress the closures of churches in Scotland. I'm grateful to our new moderator, Ivor, for his uh, address this morning. And he mentioned Thomas Chalmers a number of times. Thomas Chalmers, in July 1844, stood in Edinburgh and he announced a church planting program called it Church Extension. And he had the desire to plant no fewer than 60 new churches in the poorest communities of Edinburgh. I think that's amazing. And I think probably it is to our shame as a church that we've taken our foot off the gas in terms of the church planting imperative in reaching new people and evangelizing our nation that we find in Scripture. And so I'm excited, really excited, to see momentum gathering. But it does need us to be working hard, to be praying hard for the multiplication of churches to reach new people with the saving message of Jesus. And I think the mission board and the report is a real encouragement. It certainly is to me, because I think it's waking us up to the task that we have and the urgency that there is to see healthy gospel churches in all the communities of Scotland. There are lots of communities, 
and still so many need good gospel churches in them. So thank you to the Mission Board for their hard work. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, we have an order of the day now, I believe. Um, so uh, William Frizzell is here uh, from the bookshop, and uh, we're going to invite William up to come and uh, address the General Assembly and sell you some books at discounted prices and some great bargains will be on offer, I'm sure. Thanks, William, and welcome to the General Assembly. Uh, Mr. Moderator, Commissioners and ladies and gentlemen, uh, can I begin just by thanking you very much for allowing me this opportunity to share with you a bit about the work and ministry of Mound Books, and also for asking us to provide the book stall this year. Uh, it's great to be able to sell some books to you, and it's great to be able to serve the Lord and to serve the church in this way as well. Now, I know quite a few of you, especially those of you based in Edinburgh, know who I am already, but as uh, Neil said, my name is William Frizzell, and I am the manager of Mound Books here in Edinburgh. Uh, if you haven't worked out already, I am, yes, originally from Northern Ireland, but I came over to Scotland just over six and a half years ago to study at ETS, and I've been the manager ever since I graduated back in 2019. So what is Mound Books all about? What do we seek to do as a bookshop? Well, quite simply, we are a reformed and evangelical Christian bookshop. It's, it is quite simple, it's as simple as that, and we're based right here in the heart of Edinburgh on the Mound. Those of you who remember the old a free church bookshop. We're in exactly the same place as that underneath the ETS offices. Uh, and we were established in October 2019 to fill that sad void left by the closure of the free church bookshop. And the mission of Mound Books is to make Christ known in Scotland. And what we do is we seek to do this by providing access to good, solid, biblical Christian books as easily and as economically as possible. This is why we fundamentally and passionately believe in the importance of having a physical bookshop right here in the heart of Edinburgh. You see, people have to look intentionally online for a website. They have to know what they're looking for. But having a physical Christian bookshop right in the heart of Edinburgh with thousands of people walking past on a daily basis, especially today, uh, as an example, uh, is a great opportunity to share the gospel, a great opportunity to make Christ known in Scotland and even beyond. You see, many people these days don't see the words Christian and bookshop either put together or at all, especially on the front of a shop. And we have many people coming in on a daily basis asking what a Christian bookshop is all about. What does it mean to be a reformed Christian? What does it even mean to be a Christian full stop? So many gospel opportunities are given simply by having a physical bookshop here in Edinburgh. And many of these people with questions then leave with books, with literature, that points them to Christ. And that's what we're all about. We're about making Christ and his saving grace known to the people of Edinburgh and hopefully to Scotland. Our charity status as a shop also enables us to fulfill this mission, of course. It allows us to offer considerable discounts on our books, uh, the bit you're all looking forward to. For example, every single book that we currently have in stock on our website and, on, um, and in the bookstall downstairs and in our shop on the mound has at least 15% off the recommended price. And as you'll see later on in the bookstall, we have several books with us today that are over 60% off the recommended price. So make yourselves at home downstairs and buy lots of books. We've got lots of bags. Whatever you need, we'll give it to you. Buy books. But of course, Mound Books is much more than just a physical bookshop in Edinburgh. It's much more than just an online retail outlet. We also provide book stalls at conferences across Scotland and the north of England, along with various book uh, tables at individual churches. And we've had some very successful ones over the past few months and the past year or two at several free churches across the country, uh, notably down at Campbelltown and also more locally at Grace Church Leith as well. And if you are interested at all at having a book table at your church, whether it be small or large, doesn't matter what the size is, or if you're hosting a conference of any size, or if you'd just like to know more about the work of Mound Books, feel free to speak to me afterwards. I'll be delighted to discuss uh, your requirements with you. Now, I should also add that on top of our already discounted books, we offer a 10% discount to all churches, uh, Sunday schools, Bible classes, etc. And we also offer a 10% discount to all ministers, Sunday school teachers, elders, 
uh, and leaders of uh, local churches on top, remember this, on top of our already highly discounted prices. So if you're lucky today, you might get one or two books at nearly 90% off, so that's not to be missed. Um, but for this week only, uh, we are also offering this 10% to every single person who is currently here today. So if you're not a minister, if you're not an elder, then this week only, you can also get 10% off. So don't miss out that opportunity uh, this week. Well, just now, hopefully this works. I've got a very brief video to show you, just two or three minutes long, uh, to give you a bit more insight as to what the work of Mound Books is really like. And I'll give you a bit of a guided tour of the shop as well. Afterwards, I'll come back and give you some highlights of some books available downstairs. So we watch this video, please. Thank you. Mind Books was established in October 2019 with the mission of making Christ known in Scotland. We are an evangelical and reformed Christian bookshop. We are reformed in that we believe that the Bible teaches us that we are saved to eternal life, not by our own righteousness, our own works or our own actions, but rather by the electing grace of the living God. And the books that we stock here in the shop reflect that view and understanding. But we are also evangelical. The Bible teaches us that we are to go and make disciples of all nations. And as a bookshop and as a business, we take that command of Jesus very seriously. As I said, our mission is to make Christ known in Scotland, and we endeavour to do this by getting solid biblical literature into the hands of our customers as easily and as economically as possible. We pride ourselves in our central Edinburgh location. We're only a two minute walk away from Edinburgh's historic castle and Royal Mile. We're a less than five minute walk from Edinburgh Waverley, Edinburgh's main railway station, not to mention the numerous buses that go past our door. We believe that in order to fulfill our part in God's commission, in that great commission which he's given to us, we need to be where the people are where they live, where they work, and where they shop. And that's why we are so blessed with the location that God has given us here on the mound. This is the best place for us to achieve this. But we are more than just a bricks and mortar shop. You can also visit us and order from us online. On our website, you will find our full range of titles, both new and secondhand. We ship worldwide and we offer free delivery to any UK address on orders over 15 pounds. For orders less than £15, we charge just £2.50 for postage and packaging. A rapidly growing feature of Mound Books, both online and in store, is our second-hand selection. Here you will find a vast range of titles, many of which are in brand new condition, ranging from theology and doctrine, church history and commentaries, to more practical areas such as living the Christian life, ethics, worship and church leadership and pastoral duties. We add new listings to the second-hand section on our website on a daily basis, so make sure to check that out, especially if you're looking for that rare title. Aside from in-store and online sales, we also provide book stalls for conferences and church events. If you would like to know more about anything in this video, please do not hesitate to contact us. You can give us a call on 07863 905 900. You can email us at moundbooks at gmail.com or you can drop us a message on Facebook or Instagram. Our shop is open from 9.30am to 5pm Monday through to Saturday and we look forward to seeing you visiting with us soon. Thank you. It's always very cringy to hear your own voice and to see yourself on video. Uh, could I also give a special thanks to Mr Fergus Munro who I don't think is here today for his help in putting that video together uh, as well. Uh, well, just, uh, just as I close, I want to share with you a few exciting things. A few books that we've got available in the bookstall downstairs. The first one we have is uh, released very recently. This is uh, The Loveliest Place, and it's written by Dustin Benj. And it's really uh, an insight into what the church should be, what the church ought to be, what it exists for, how it should be, as the title suggests, the loveliest place, as it ought to reflect the beauty and the glory of the Lord. So that's downstairs, just 13.50. Uh, secondly, we have a, another new title, again, uh, published by uh, Reformation Heritage this time, and it's called Following God Fully, which is an introduction to the Puritans, and that's written by uh, Joel Beakey and Michael Reeves, two very well-known people indeed. And it's exactly what it says on the cover. That's the good thing about selling books. It's very easy to identify what they say inside just by the outside. 
Uh, and it discusses what the Puritans are, who they were, what they did, and perhaps most importantly of all, why they are still important to us today and why we should read them. So that's downstairs, just 1599. Uh, following that, we have a book which I'm sure we're all very familiar with. If not, you all have a copy already, perhaps. Uh, Bavinck, A Critical Biography by James Eglinton. Now this one was really, is what I call one of the lost books. It was published in 2020, remember, pandemics, lockdowns. So not everyone got a copy of this that should have got a copy. So what we've done is we've uh, reduced this massively in price. This is just 18.99. So the recommended price is 32.50, so that's almost half price. So that's available downstairs. If you missed it first time, you've got no excuses this time. Just 18.99 uh, downstairs. Uh, and then just before I finish, we have Little, uh, little Sproul, R.C. Sproul's Little Book, What is Reformed Theology? Uh, again, it's a, it's a little book at a little price, just three pounds, okay, that's an absolute steal, three pounds, that's normally 12, uh, and it's really just an introduction, a basic introduction as to what it means to be a reformed Christian, what is Calvinism all about, what is the five points of Calvinism all about, and it may not be one that you may want necessarily yourself, but if anyone in your congregation or any family members struggling to come to terms with reformed theology, it's an ideal book for them, just three pounds, we've literally got hundreds with us downstairs, so make use of that. And then finally, lastly, and I do promise this because I know you're hungry for your lunch, uh, we have Richard Phillips' little book, uh, The Masculine Mandate. And it's really a perfect book for the days that we now find ourselves in. It cuts through all the cultural confusion over gender roles to establish what it really means to be a true man of the living God. And again, we have that at a special price of just five pounds for just from 14. So that's five pounds downstairs. Well, that's really all I have to say to you uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's great to be with you and great to serve the church and the Lord in this way. And we do look forward to speaking to you later on. If you do have any questions, you'll find me at the bookstall every day this week. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, William. Uh, William is a great guy. Uh, we have a great relationship. Uh, he puts up with, he's totally impervious to all my bad moods and my uh, irritations and uh, bad temper and all the rest of it. And I remember when he came to ETS at first, he was, he'd left school, just a school leaver. And he, he couldn't put two words together. He was so shy. <laughs> and uh, today is an example of what ETS and marriage does for you. <laughs> but he's still a Baptist. That's one thing we're still working on. <laughs> No, thank you so much, William. It's a real pleasure doing business with you, and uh, um, it, it's great to have him in the building. It really is, and I mean that very, very uh, much. And uh, I've always found his prices are really competitive, so please um, uh, support that work. I think it's a worthy uh, shop to support. It's really good. That's it uh, for the moment. Are, are there intimations? Tomorrow, the, the following committees are due to meet. The examination of uh, records of boards and committees should meet at 12.30 in room 8. Uh, the documents have been sent to the convener, so I'm sure you'll be guided through that. Uh, the uh, receiving party for the Lord High Commissioner will meet around the clerk's desk, desk at 5 p.m., and those who are on that group, uh, they have been sent to the order for the day, so we'll discuss that at 5 p.m. Yeah, and if uh, clerks of boards and committees haven't yet deposited their records in Romania, they should do so as soon as possible. We do an order of the day at 4 p.m. to receive delegates. We have Lorraine from OM. Unfortunately, Graham Nichols is unwell. Graham from Affinity, and he won't be able to be with us, so we do regret that. But we will have the order of the day for Lorraine at 4 p.m. It's a call for amendments and addenda to the ETS report, the Ecumenical Regions report, and the Samundi and Praise report. And just to remind commissioners that lunches, teas and coffees are available downstairs. And on that note, the General Assembly suspend business to resume at 2 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Jen.